welcome to the second the workshop uh, for senior researchers on climate extremes and attribution of climate extremes. This workshop is organized is part of our uh, extreme clean clean project, and it should have been hosted by the Loughborough University. And because of this COVID unfavorable COVID situation, we are forced to go online. Um, today we have Professor Rob Wilby, who will be our host today, and uh, he will tell you something more about um, statistical downscaling, and before that he will welcome you to our workshop. So Rob, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Biljana, and good morning everyone. Welcome to a, a sunny and frosty morning here on our beautiful campus at Loughborough University, and just to put you in the mood. I'm showing you a nice aerial photograph which gives you a sense of our campus. It's a, a lovely green site. It's um, not quite 200 hectares, so it's one of the largest campuses in Europe. And we have over 20,000 students and our staff come from more than 100 countries. So it's a, it's a really wonderfully um, diverse and, and active place to work. Um, it's, it, it, the, the situation is as it is, so sadly we can't host you here at Loughborough University. I hope a time will come when we will be able to host you at the university and we can meet in three dimensions and discuss our shared interests. But today we're going to do the best we can using the um, virtual presentations and exercises. Hopefully all the technology will be kind to us and we'll be patient with each other as we work through the various exercises and hopefully it will all come together. So what are we going to try and cover today? Let's just move on. So I'm conscious that some of you may have attended the previous workshop on statistical downscaling, so, uh, and, and others may not have much understanding of what statistical downscaling is about. So I'm going to produce a very quick summary of what statistical downscaling is, and then move almost straight away into some of the practicalities around using this technique for generating local climate change scenarios. Then we'll move into the first part of the practical session where we will actually begin working with the statistical downscaling model. And today we're going to concentrate on modeling extreme rainfall amounts. If you're interested in temperature, I encourage you to go back to the recorded presentations and exercise from the last workshop in which we went through the process of modeling extreme temperatures. There's going to be lots of opportunities to raise questions and to discuss any concerns or issues that arise from the use of the tool. And then this will carry on after lunch um, as we get deeper into the analysis and the interpretation of the results of the downscaling. And then finally, I will have a, a a, a, a talk in which I will explain to you the rationale for the downscaling and how this is used in an applied sense to inform adaptation thinking and planning. So hopefully that will produce a nice wrapper around the, the day's proceedings. If there's time there, there may be a, a quiz and some closing remarks and discussions at the end. So before I begin, is, does anyone have any Questions or concerns? Bujana, is that all clear, do you think? Yeah, okay. All right then. So let me begin by explaining to you what statistical downscaling is. And again, I'm conscious that um, some of you may have um, heard this or know this already, but please bear with me as we move through the, these introductory slides. So the, the, the first point to make is that um, global climate models are increasingly being used to inform our understanding of future climate risk. They've long been used to help us understand how future greenhouse gas emissions might play out and affect the global climate, 
but increasingly we're using climate model information to understand how climate risks from extreme weather events, for example, might play out in the future. The problem with that is that the, the typical climate model resolution is of tens or hundreds of uh, square kilometers, and the typical resolution of the decisions where we're looking for risk assessment or planning for adaptation or resilience measures, those decisions tend to occur at much finer and much more local scales. So we have a mismatch in scale between the very coarse global scale resolution of the climate models and the very fine and local scale of the decision context. And statistical downscaling is one amongst a whole family of techniques for bridging that spatial gap between the coarse scale and the large scale. And it's represented here with this graphic showing the large boxes at the GCM or global climate model scale and the much finer boxes at the river basin or city scale or even smaller scales. And the traditional way in which we've used these climate models is very much top down in that we begin with this large view of the climate system and we use the statistics or the, the downscaling methods to move fine, to finer and finer resolutions. So in the UK, for example, we have regional climate model experiments, which you'll be hearing about tomorrow and later in the week, which operate at about 10 kilometers resolution, which is still relatively uh, large areas um, for assessing impacts. So we might want to be coming down to one kilometer if we are interested in urban areas or, or city impacts, or even a few meters if we're in, interested in impacts at the scale of a, a field or a farm, or even down to point scale if we're interested in processes such as future erosion of soils, which have very, very localized impacts. So we're trying to develop a set of techniques that will bridge this gap between the large scale global climate model information and the scale at which we are seeking to make decisions or to evaluate risks in the future. And I've shown this slide before, which is basically giving you an overview of all the downscaling methods that I could think of. Um, and essentially, the way to look at this is in terms of um, a toolbox of techniques of increasing complexity. And when we're deciding which tool to use from a toolbox, the first question we're always asking ourselves is what's the purpose of the, of the study, of the analysis? What am I trying to achieve? Um, and how much resource uh, do I have? What, how much time do I have? What computing assets do I have available to me? And, and those sorts of questions help us decide which of the downscaling methods to use. So if we have very limited time and resources and we just want a sort of a general understanding of what the local climate might look like based on climate model information, the simplest approach might simply be to um, interpolate in space to the locations of interest. Simple interpolation, or as some have called this unintelligent downscaling because there's no value added. There's no additional insight being added. We're just resolving the climate model information at apparently more um, finer resolutions. Alternatively, we might take the changes such as the change in temperature from the global climate model and add that to our observed record. And that would give us a, a, a local climate scenario that reflects the, the local conditions at the weather station, as well as the changes projected by the climate models. Quite a, um, quite a lot of effort in recent years has gone into so-called bias correction methods, where simple scaling methods, um, quantile or quantile, quantile mapping are used 
to match the climate model output to the local output. So for example, we might correlate the first percentile from the climate model of the precipitation with the first percentile of the precipitation at the local scale. We might also have the second percentile against the second percentile between the GCM and the local scale. And through that quantile mapping, we can sketch, we can translate the core scale information from the climate model onto the local scale weather information. And then, as I mentioned, at the very um, largest, uh, it, the, the most complex systems and tools that we have available are through the dynamical downscaling. And you'll be hearing about that um, tomorrow and later in, in the week. And regional climate models are centrally physical climate models that have the same processes as the large scale global climate models, but are operating at much finer spatial resolutions and provide additional spatial um, precision, but not necessarily accuracy to the, the local simulations. Then in between, we have these, um, th these statistical techniques, and this is what we're going to be concentrating on today. And then broadly speaking, there are three main types of statistical downscaling. Those that use weather type classification, those that use weather generators, and those that use transfer functions such as regression analysis to relate the large scale to the local scale. So let me just very briefly give you an example of each one of these. So an example of the weather typing methods is shown here where um, the researchers were, were interested in the relationship between the large scale pressure patterns and the occurrence of um, very cold episodes in Central Europe. So with, you can see in this scheme, with knowledge of the large scale weather patterns, the circulation that you can see on the top row, these are these mean sea level pressure patterns. And then beneath, we have the anomalies where you've got higher or lower pre pressure than average. We can then, determine what pressure anomalies are associated with particular events of interest. And here it is the cold episodes. So we can then count the frequency of these weather patterns in, in global climate model simulations of the present and of global uh, climate model simulations of the future. And we can see how the number of those um, weather patterns have changed through time. And from that, we can make an inference of the change in the frequency of the cold episodes. So this is a really, um, I think actually the weather, weather typing approach is a very appealing one because it gives us a sense of the physical processes, the dynamics, the weather patterns that relate to the local conditions of interest. And um, here we can see, you know, very clearly the types of weather pattern associated with the cold episodes across Europe. So that's the first type. The second type are um, stochastic models, models that simulate the occurrence of an event and then the magnitude of the event. So, for example, we might be trying to simulate the statistical occurrence of a wet day at a location. And when we've determined whether or not we have a wet or a dry day, then we determine the amount of rainfall on that day. And here's an example of some output from a stochastic weather generator calibrated for data, rainfall data in Cambridge. And it's a very simple modeling approach. You just, in this case, you're, you're calibrating the model on what's the likelihood of a dry day turning into a wet day or wet to a wet, or dry to dry, or wet to dry. So you can, you can extract those statistics from the observational data. And straight away, for example, you can see here that the chance of a dry day turning into a dry day is about 71%. And the chance of a wet day 
going into a wet day is 65 percent so there is an uh, persistence there's a memory in the weather that we're exploiting here and you can see that memory in the clustering of these um, wet days along the bottom where you see the bars this is where rainfall has been simulated and it captures the observed clustering of events using this very simple um, um, Markov model um, simulation where we're moving from one state to another and then if we determine that there's been a rain day the next decision is well what distribution should we use to simulate the, the wet day amount we might use um, an exponential distribution a gamma distribution or something like that but it can be tailored it can be customized to the the distribution of rainfall amounts at your site to give the best possible simulation and then the third method is the transfer function approach which is best thought of as a regression based technique and um, here for example we might be interested in the occurrence and the amounts of rainfall or temperature at sites across Morocco and we simply statistically regress the weather patterns of interest at the large scale the predictor variables such as mean pressure or even the rainfall amount from the global climate model we regress that against the conditions at the local sites um, across Morocco and straight away we we capture the detail of the behavior at the local scale and it's important to um, highlight that um, each of these methods whether it's weather typing weather generators or transfer function methods they all produce um, they have different strengths and weaknesses so there's there's no uniformly best downscaling method and i really want to stress that that when we choose a downscaling method we want to just begin the process by thinking about what are we trying to achieve what is the application of the downscaling which of these methods would be most appropriate for example in analyzing heat waves or extreme ra rainfall or snow melt across a large river basin so we begin by asking those kinds of questions and then we think about well okay these this method is strong at looking at um larger scale properties the regression method is relatively straightforward to implement whereas the weather typing method um, you might think well this could take much longer to set up because i've got to classify the weather patterns as a first step it takes more effort than it would do to apply a regression based approach so we need to go into this um, process with our eyes open and a, a critical mindset in terms of which of the downscaling methods meet our, our particular needs and there's lots of literature out there that um, summarizes the strengths and weaknesses of these different approaches and I'm, I'm happy to answer questions on that that later but if we just move on now to consider um, some of the practicalities around using a particular tool that we're looking at today which is the statistical downscaling model and here i want to just stress from outset that this particular downscaling tool is a mixture of two techniques it uses it has features of the weather generator approach and it has features of the transfer function approach so it's using the weather generator to model the occurrence of um, rainfall for example helping to capture the 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 day-to-day uh, -day occurrence of an event and it's doing that by regressing the, the the model parameters of the weather generator to large-scale weather patterns and that's all you need to know that's enough technical detail about the, the, this particular model. We're much more concerned about how we go about using these types of tool today. But if you're interested, again, there's lots of literature that explains 
the technical underpinning of this tool. One potentially useful resource for those of you who are thinking about um, starting with statistical downscaling is to, is to refer to this document produced by the IPCC, TGICA, in 2004. You might be thinking, well, well that's, a, that's a bit out of date. It's 17 years old now. Why should I read a 17-year-old report? Well, the, the, the truth is that actually the downscaling techniques haven't really evolved in, in radically different ways in the, in the last 20 years. And the principles that are laid out in this uh, concise document still hold today as they did in 2004. And it, it's focused on lots of very practical considerations. Like I've said already to you, we need to begin by thinking about the study objectives, what type of data we have available, what is the most appropriate downscaling method to implement? How do we choose the ingredients or the predictive variables that we put into the downscaling? And how do we evaluate the, the models? So uh, I'd encourage you to, to take a look at this, this document. And by the way, all of the slides are going to be made um, available. And if you just click on any of these blue links, it will the hyperlink will take you directly to any of the documents or reports that I'm mentioning in, in the presentations. So um, here are just some of the some of the, the tips that emerge from this these guiding principles. And some of these are really obvious. Some of these are just good scientific practice around model building. So the first tip is when we're starting to look at those relationships between the large scale and the local scale, it's helpful to um, inspect our data visually. So here, for example, was a scatter plot that emerged from the last workshop where on the horizontal axis, we've got the direct shortwave radiation here. And on the vertical axis, we've got the maximum daily temperature measured in Novi Sad. And you can see that there's um, a, a, a relationship between the two. It's not a perfect relationship because there's a lot of scatter, but this tells us by visually inspecting the data that um, this particular variable could be helpful in developing a statistical downscaling model. Secondly, when we're trying to find um, from our mixture of variables from describing the large scale climate um, conditions, we're trying to find variables that provide unique explanatory power. So give us a lot of information about what's going on locally. And later on, we'll be looking at tables like this using rainfall data from Novi Sad. And we can use techniques like partial correlation analysis within the tool to help us determine what is the unique information being provided by one variable. And in this case, we can see this particular variable, NSET PUF, which is a shorthand for the strength of the airflow across the area, uh, is uh, statistically insignificant because it has a low partial correlation, which tells us that um, this particular variable is just duplicating information from other variables. So we can omit this model because the information from this variable is contained in others. And this helps us to build a parsimonious model. We're trying to build a climate model, a downscaling model that is based on the smallest number of predictive variables. So it's parsimonious. It has a low number of variables and a low number of parameters. And then we're always trying to go back to the physical understanding. Even though we're building a statistical model, we want to have confidence that the, um, that, that the model makes physical sense. So, 
these were the four or five variables that emerged from the last workshop when we were trying to model maximum daily temperature. So we can see that the four key variables that I thought emerged were for direct shortwave radiation. And that, of course, is explaining the energy balance at the location. The mean sea level pressure was another variable that can be thought of as um, an indicator of blocking conditions or conditions that lead to persistent weather patterns over an area. We had um, a west-east airflow, which we might think of as um, air, warm air from the continent or, uh, or um, further across it from Western Europe, moving into the area, so advected heat. And then we had um, the thickness of the atmosphere given by the 850 hectopascal height. And that again is helping us to understand the, the blocking. Finally, we also saw that the maximum temperature from one day to the next was highly autocorrelated. So um, that variable helps us build in persistence to allow the buildup and the, and the, and the longevity of a heat wave. That all might sound quite um, technical to you, but the key principle here is that later on when we're looking at the predictive variables, we really need to be um, having a good idea as to why this particular variable makes sense. And it's not just a statistical artifact that we're just throwing a variable in there because it seems to relate to the local conditions. We want to be able to justify the choice of the variables that we include. We also want to be um, validating the model with independent data. So we, we fit the model on one part of the record and then test it on another part of the record. We want to be doing that using um, lots of different tests not just relying on the correlation coefficient or the amount of explained variance. We want to see whether or not the model produces distributions of extremes and persistence, uh, the average and seasonal conditions. So we want to test the model in lots of different ways to, to ensure that it's generally robust. And also, um, we have to confront the reality that our data sets might contain trends. And for statistical models, non-stationary conditions can be problematic. I prefer to turn that around and say, well, let's see if our model can cope with these non-stationary conditions. We might calibrate the model on one period and see if it can reproduce the changes at the location. So it provides a very um, strong test of the model and whether or not the information in the downscaling variables like the pressure patterns, the airflow, the humidity, whether these are able to capture the observed non-stationary non conditions. So for example, here we can see a dramatic rise in the maximum temperatures at Novi Sad since the 1970s. And in the red line, you can see that the downscaling model actually captured that uh, change in maximum temperatures very well. That gives us confidence that it can then be applied to future conditions. We can also use this model to um, infill and correct past data. Here I've zoomed in on a particular year, 2013, where we identified one missing day and we used the downscaling model to estimate what the conditions were on that day. And that's, uh, that's an application that we'll be coming back to uh, later on. And if we zoom in even more, we can use the model to, to simulate um, extreme events. Um, here was, for example, the 2007 heat wave that again occurred in Novi Sad. And you can see that the downscaling model gave a very credible representation of that particular heat wave. So just to, to sum up this very rapid introduction to downscaling, 
Um, later on, we're going to be seeing that there are these key steps that we need to go through when we're applying a downscaling model. So first of all, we need to be confident that the information that we're putting into the model, model is high quality. So we spend time quality assuring data, checking that it's, it's that we have confidence in this information even before we be begin the model building. The second step is then to decide what are the large scale weather patterns and variables that are related to the local scale responses. So which predictive variables are most promising? We then have to make decisions about which period of record we will use for model calibration and which periods will we use for validation. And then finally, we'll be applying the model to fill in data to simulate the present and also to produce um, scenarios of extreme events for future impact and adaptation planning. So that's basically what we're going to be trying to, to cover today later on through the, the exercises. So I know that that's a, that's a lot to cover for first thing on a Monday morning, and it's pretty heavy, I'm sure. So um, while I go and turn the lights on, Bilyana, if you'd like to take any questions before I move, set up the, the next Primer talk, okay? Uh, well, you can, if you like, you can post the questions in the chat and then we can read them or you can just unmute your microphone and ask. Either way is fine. So if there are any questions, please just put it in the chat or unmute your microphone and ask. Nothing in the chat. Okay. Well, let's um, move straight on to the... Um, next primer and again please if you have any questions put them in the chat as we go along this will be the the uh, we have another talk now and then we'll have a break and then we'll move directly into the hands-on practical exercise after the the break let's just bear with me a second while i change the slides thank you so let's try that one Right. Okay, Biliana, is that good? Can you see my new slide? Yeah. We're good. Yeah, yeah. All right then, okay. So um, in this primer, I'm going to just unpack some of the ideas that I, I just gave to you and to, to walk you through some of the practical things that we need to think about when we're building a statistical downscaling model. And when I, when I talk about the practicalities of downscaling, I, I like to begin with this slide, which was um, of an, an area of Central Asia. And I, I photographed this on my way back from a, um, a project in Tajikistan. And I was looking down at this landscape, which is just amazing, and thinking, how would I even begin to build a, a model of the local climate conditions in one valley as opposed to the next or on one mountain top as opposed to the next. What, what careful checks and um, steps would I need to take to even begin to start modeling the, the, the climate conditions in this sort of landscape? If I was, for example, thinking about how future water resources might change in this headwater area or how um, the, the, the future rainfall uh, and risk of flash flooding or of soil erosion or what might the impacts be on the, the, the agricultural systems in the, in the valleys. So those sorts of questions um, lead us to some very practical issues and that's what I'm going to be walking through you now. Um, 
uh, step by step some of the things we need to think about. So as I, I've already suggested, as well as the IPCC um, document on statistical downscaling, there are also these other very early um, reports produced by IPCC, um, United Nations Development Programme and, and such like, which provide helpful introductory remarks about how we develop climate change scenarios and how we might use them. And although, you know, we've got another 15 years of work and research since these publications, the, the underlying principles of why are we building a climate change scenario? How are we trying to apply it in vulnerability and adaptation assessment? Much of that thinking has remained the same. And um, there's, a, there's a lot of good knowledge and wisdom in these early documents that I, I encourage you to refer to. The, the, the UNDP one also provides a, a nice summary of the different types of tool that are out there for producing climate change scenarios. And here I'm giving you some examples of the, the choices that you have um, if you're interested in statistical downscaling. So you might get to the end of today and think, oh, that was all, um, all, all well and good, but I think I'll, I'll go with a different type of downscaling tool or resource than the statistical downscaling model. So we're gonna be concentrating on the use of the top left one, but there are of course other resources available through Cordex, which produces um, regional climate scenarios for most of the most of the earth now in fact but for different patches so this is for the european domain and you can go to the cordex website and you can obtain very detailed regional climate simulations i'm guessing that you'll probably hear more about that um, later this week alternatively you might um, pick a, a different type of weather generator tool uh, one of the most famous ones that's been around again for nearly 20 years is the, the Lars, Lars WGen. And this is a, a, a statistical tool that allows the rapid simulation of climate change scenarios. And it's found a lot of applications in the agricultural sector. So for those of you who are interested in agricultural impacts, this might be a, a useful tool to, to check out because it simultaneously produces all the, all the variables that you might need for a, um, a crop model, such as uh, the rainfall, the sunshine, the temperature, the humidity uh, and wind speed simultaneously. And it produces that statistically. Or you might turn to existing archives like the um, bias correction data and Increasingly, there are lots of international organizations providing these global resources of bias corrected global climate model information. And this is probably, you know, the, the, the quickest and easiest way in which you can get to, to local information. But you have to be wary, careful of how these um, how these data were produced, whether or not the assumptions are sound. And, and sometimes the bias corrected information may be at um, monthly timescales, whereas we today are thinking mainly about daily or even sub daily timescales. So the timescale of the information that you're after also matters. It's also um, very important to be critical like okay i'm going to invest some time in building a downscaling model what's the value added what's the benefit of doing this the, from all the time and, and the effort so if we look at the this classic um study by schmidley et al again about 15 years ago but it really nicely shows that the observed data in the top left hand corner which is rainfall over essentially over the, the, the swiss alps and um, parts of Central Europe. So the top left is the observed pattern and on the right is what we would have got from um, a climate model at the core scale. So you can see there's no there's no similarity at all between the this one and this one. So 
if we're trying to produce a pattern like that from this sort of information, we've got a, a big job ahead. You can see from the regional climate models now, and it, there's three regional climate models shown in the bottom here, the patterns are starting to look much more like the observed. So we can see that there is some benefit in running the regional climate model to simulate the local rainfall. It's, it's getting us closer to the observ observations compared with the raw climate model information. So being conscious of the value added is always important. So here we go. A, a question to, to you to think about is here in um, some some nice scenes on and some some nasty scenes of flooding in Serbia. Um, what what sorts of consideration would we have here in terms of building a downscaled scenario? So that's my question to you. Anyone got any thoughts? How do I, you know, what if I'm if I'm worried about how an ecosystem might change in a uh, conservation area or how the wetland water table might change or the risk of flooding or the risk of high temperatures in an urban environment? What sorts of things do I need to think about? Any thoughts? Okay. It should be um, the topography. So, if as on your picture on the left hand side, there's a mountain. So, the height of certain areas. That's right. Yeah. The, 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 the thank you, Natasha. Good to have a, a former student here in our midst. <laughs> knows how to answer the questions. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Natasha. Yeah. So, we, we, need, a, we need a technique that can capture and reflect subtle variations in in elevation for starters so the conditions on the on the top of this mountain ridge are going to be probably very different to the conditions down in the valley so we need a technique that can resolve that if if we're for example interested in ecosystem change in this um in this area so uh, if we're working with a regional climate model grid that is 10 kilometers resolution, that's going to be too coarse to capture such subtle variations in the, the, the topography that could, could really matter to the thing that we're concerned about. Okay, well, let me give you some example of some of the other things we need to, to think about. So if we're thinking about the future projections, we need to be thinking about which emissions pathway should we be using to project the future conditions? And of course, with before COP26, we were looking at a future where the emissions were probably going to give us between two and a half and three degrees of cel uh, Celsius of global mean warming. Uh, realistically, we're probably still looking at two degrees of warming, but if everyone does everything that they promise to do at COP, we might um, reduce global mean temperatures to 1.8 degrees Celsius. So the results that we get from our downscaling, again, first of fundamentally depend upon the assumptions we make about the future global climate system, which in turn depends on very much the emissions pathway that we as humankind are going to collectively take over coming decades. So the emissions pathway is a critical factor. Also, as we see from this graphic, the, the results that we get from the downscaling depend very much on the choice of the global climate model. So here's a, here's a site in Djibouti um in in east africa where we downscaled changes in rainfall and temperature based on uh six or seven climate models shown on the bottom so depending upon the climate model we pick we might see 
plus 50 percent in the rainfall or you might see minus 30 percent so the choice of the climate model is critical in shaping the projected local changes in rainfall temperature also depends on the climate model but at least it's all the same sign it's, they're all pluses here they're all somewhere between uh, two and three and a half degrees celsius at this location but the choice of the climate model is crucial and indeed so is the choice of the downscaling method this rather complicated graphic compares the changes in a whole set of different types of rainfall index these PAV, PINT, P90. These are all different indicators of rainfall. The average rainfall, the 90th percentile. This one here is the uh, five day total rainfall and so forth. And each of these boxes represents a different downscaling model. And you can see uh, for all of these sites, um, lots of differences between the, the, the downscaling methods and also differences depending upon the, the indicator that we're using. So which downscaling method, singular or plural, we use will determine the projected change at the local scale. Also, the relative skill and the performance of the downscaling model depends on the indicators that we use. So once more, I want to stress that there is no single downscaling method that is going to be best at everything. So it absolutely depends on what are we trying to achieve? Are we more interested in five day rainfall totals than we are of average rainfall conditions or are we more interested in extreme rainfall which of those methods gives us the 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 best simulation um, we can inform that sort of thinking from previous studies and there's a huge there's a huge amount of literature on downscaling that can help us decide which downscaling method we might turn to and of course, these factors um, combine as well. So if we um, have a different GCM combined with a different downscaling method, here's some changes in spring rainfall downscaled for sites in Morocco. Once more, we can see how much variation we get in the downscaled rainfall, just depending upon the choice of climate model um, so we've got um, three climate models, CSIRO, ECM4 and Hadley model three, shown in yellow, green and blue. So that's showing the variation due to the choice of the, down, of the climate, global climate model. And the blue and the red shows the difference that you get depending upon the choice of downscaling model uh, on a site by site basis. So that gives you a sense of how much uncertainty is introduced by the choice of GCM and by the choice of downscaling method. Um, later on today, we're going to see that as we build the models, the downscaling may perform better for some seasons than for others. And the strength of the predictor variable relationship from the large scale to the local scale varies by season. So here's an example from um, the North UK, where we're looking at the strength of the correlation between rainfall wet day amounts in, in each month, January to December, uh, and how that strength varies for different two different predictor variables. So the blue is for the strength of the relationship with mean sea level pressure. So you can see that that relationship is stronger in the strongest in the summer months and weaker in the winter, whereas the relationship with the um, specific humidity, the humidity variable here, is strongest in the winter and weakest in the summer. 
So we need to be conscious of the fact that the variables, the ingredients that we put into the downscaling model vary in strength uh, and in information content, depending upon the time of year. And that will also be reflected in the ability of that downscaling model to produce accurate representations of the local behavior. Later on as well, we're also going to see that we need to invest quite a bit of time in deciding which predictive variable to use. And this is again a, a re really nice early study by Crawford et al, um, who looked at the, um, the extent to which different predictive variables shown in these color boxes here explain uh, rainfall in uh, sites across Northern Ireland. And you can see that the, the mi optimal mix of predictors varies by site. No, no two sites have the, really the same colors uh, or amount of explained variance as shown by the, the, the pie chart. But you can see sort of areas where they are, there are certain um, groups of variables that are clustering by the colors. But you can also see that the um, mix of predictive variables depends on the season. So spring, summer, autumn, and winter. Again, stressing the, the need to spend a fair amount of time concentrating on a sensible choice of predictive variables. And that goes back to my earlier remarks that we ideally we want to have a good physical rationale for choosing the predictive variables at our specific sites. And so it's worth spending time and effort concentrating on this uh, step of the downscaling. Um, sixthly, the, the downscaling also depends on the predictor variable domain that we're, we're working with. So if this is a, a study from, from Spain where the crosses represent the sites, the weather stations we're trying to downscale. So if we look at here in Southeast Spain, um, the, the numbers in the boxes show the locations where you would find the strongest predictive variable. And the, the point is, it's, it's not always in the box in which we're downscaling. We might find a stronger relationship by looking at a predictive variable that is upstream or downstream of the site or not necessarily right over the site. And why might that be? Uh, this is a really sort of getting into a, a, a technical nuance here. Why do you think that might be? Why might a predictive variable to the, to the west of a site be more useful than a predictive variable located on the site? Any thoughts? Well, sometimes it can be um, reflecting that in this case, if the dominant movement of weather patterns are from west to, to east, there may be uh, also a mismatch between the, the, the weather day used by the records, the weather station. I'm not sure, um, Diana, is in, in um, Serbia, is your weather day like ours, nine o'clock in the morning to nine o'clock the following morning, rather than um, midnight to midnight? Uh, no, the, the uh, measurements start at seven in the morning and last until uh, 20, 21. It's nine in the evening. So seven, 14 and 21, those are the uh, this time when the official measurements are taken. And yeah. but we also have the measurements on every hour on those automatic weather stations. So Oh, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure about uh, how long how long the day lasts. It's, I think it's uh, from midnight till midnight. I'm not sure. 
but but this is you know this is a really quite an important detail okay. because around the world uh, the the day that we use to report the weather does vary from country some from country to country um spe especially with historic records and 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 the information that we use from the climate models might be using a different day definition it might be midnight to midnight and in the uk it might be nine in the morning to nine in the morning so there's a there's a, there's a mismatch between the the day from the climate model or the reanalysis data set and the day from the the weather records and we i think this explains why there's a mismatch between the the optimal location and the sites it's cat capturing the movement of weather the mismatch in time is being compensated for by the spatial variation in the choice of the optimal domain so that's a, a subtle a subtle feature of downscaling but it's an important one to be to just be aware of what is the day that is being used at your local site to report the weather and how does that match with the information that you're using from the large scale to create your downscaling model it's a subtle detail but it means that there could be a mismatch between the two and then um, once we've built our model we want to be able to check how well is it performing and earlier i've stressed the importance of taking a multi-dimensional view on, on model performance so how well does the model produce the timing of the seasonal pattern of the variable, the magnitude of daily events, um, the size distribution of um, extremes? Um, does it capture the variability from one day to the next, the duration of um, hot or cold spells or the duration of wet spells? Does it capture the long-term cumulative totals that might be important if you're for example interested in soil moisture and the accumulative moisture deficit through time um, and how well does the downscaling capture relationships between variables for example between uh, rainfall and temperature which might be important for hydrological modeling or for aridity or crop um, analyses so we need we need to be taking um, um, a, a, this multi-dimensional view of the downscaling model performance, testing it in lots of different ways rather than just um, concentrating on, for example, the correlation between the um, the observed variable variable and the downscaled variable. And as we will see later today, the downscaling tool provides you with lots of choices for testing the model and we also want to be selecting metrics of model performance that are meaningful to our application so if we're interested in um, urban drainage systems we want to perhaps check how well the downscaling model simulates extreme rainfall uh, distributions if we're interested in um, simulating um, snowpack buildup and melt, then we might be more interested in the seasonal distribution of rainfall and temperature. So the choice of diagnostic has to reflect the, the intended application. Um, and boy, when you start digging into some of these comparisons, uh, it can get very, um, complicated like here's a here's a study in which we ask the question you know how well does SGSM the statistical downscaling model perform when compared with the WARF model as an example of a dynamical model how well do these two compare and you think well that's that's a fairly straightforward question to ask and test but it, of course it depends on the as I was saying the choice of of diagnostic here we've got three diagnostics here for the average um, uh, rainfall amount the uh, 
average on wet days only and then the 90th percentile. And this is uh, an index measuring the persistence of dry spells, uh, an index measuring the likelihood or the percentage of rain days, and then an index measuring the five day rainfall total. And the colored bars denote different ways in which we could calibrate the wharf model um, shown in the, in the green and how we might compare that with different variants of the downscaling model. So based on all of these diagnostics, can we answer the question, is wharf better than STSM or is STSM better than wharf? Well, we, we, again, we have to be more sophisticated than that and say, well, the WARF model does better than SDSM for certain types of indicator than others. And so, again, it depends very much on the choice of the, uh, of the diagnostic and the intended application. And that leads me to, to, to basically this slide, which is a distillation of 20 years of intercomparison study. So the, the, the downscaling literature is full of um, comparison studies where someone has compared method A with method B or statistical methods with dynamical methods. And I'll put my hands up, I'm, I'm to blame for quite a few of those uh, studies, but they've been very helpful in, in helping us to weigh up the strengths and weaknesses of different downscaling approach. So I think hopefully what you, you've learned already from what I've shown you, um, that the, the key factor affecting the shape of a, of a downscaled scenario is the climate model inputs that we put into it. Garbage in, garbage out. It's a classic statement. So the GCM boundary conditions really matter. And I think, secondly, we've learned over the years that statistical downscaling isn't always better than dynamical, and dynamical isn't always better than statistical. They offer very different things. Statistical downscaling is handy if we're interested in individual sites or collections of sites. Whereas dynamical downscaling is helpful if we might want to get a larger national or big catchment overviews. There's an example of how these techniques are complementary, not competing. And I, that's a really Im important principle to grasp. Um, I've just also given you some examples of how different downscaling methods give us very different scenarios that um, there is no universal set of optimum predictive variables for temperature or rainfall. We really have to, to decide what variables to use on a site by site basis. Um, we've also learned that downscaling extreme events is, is very challenging, particularly if we're trying to capture the most extreme events locally in summer, for example, of, that might cause a local flash flood. That's, that's a very complex thing to do in either a dynamical model or a statistical downscaling approach. So there are limits to what these tools can do and we'll be pushing at the boundaries of the, these limits later today. And then finally, even if our downscaling model gives us a good simulation of the present, it doesn't imply that the future change suggested by this downscaling is going to be accurate because we're making lots of big assumptions that the large scale to the local scale relationships remain valid uh, in the future, that there's, there's a degree of stationarity in the statistical relationships or that we've captured the non-stationarity well by our selection of predictive variables. So again, that comes back to being a, a key step in the, the model building process. Um, before we take a break, I just want to, um, again, give you some cautionary remarks here of when statistical downscaling could be 
problematic when we could be getting ourselves into to difficulty and here i'm i'm giving you the benefit of my uh you know some of the hard lessons i've learned over the last 20 years of when downscaling has not really given us what we want or there's been problems or big uncertainties in the downscaled results so let's start with this one um, as i've already said the key factor determining the future downscale scenarios is the choice of global climate model so we want to have confidence that those global climate models are giving a credible representation of key climate variables and conditions and this is a, a, a I think a really significant research paper it hasn't really had the attention that I think it deserves because they they basically looked at the water balance in um, all the climate models available at the time in CMIP3 and they, they, they asked the straightforward question does the amount of precipitation at the global scale from these climate models equal the amount of evaporation okay so you, you essentially they're asking how well do these different climate models conserve mass at the global scale so where you see the red bars this is these are climate models where there is more evaporation than there is precipitation at the global scale so in other words, the land is evaporating moisture, it's going into the, the, the model atmosphere. And some of that moisture is being lost in the model simulation because less rainfall is dropping out of the sky than has been evaporated. Alternatively, in the blue, we have climate models that are producing so-called ghost rainfall. So these are climate models that can generate more rainfall than evaporation so there's again mass is not being conserved it's being created somewhere in the model algorithm and it's really important if we're downscaling to have have confidence that the global climate model information we're using is is complying with some of the basic physic physical assumptions of mass conservation so there are at least four or five climate models in this study where I think there's, there's, I would be very um, unsure about downscaling from these because I don't trust them. They don't produce um, realistic global hydrology. Um, they're not conserving mass. So they fail that basic test. So why would I begin to downscale from a climate model that does not conserve mass at the global scale. And there are the, the, the authors here produced a follow up paper for uh, CMIP, uh, the, the CMIP five experiments and highlighted two or three climate models, which are again, um, quite problematic. So that's a, that's a useful thing to, to bear in mind. Then there's this, this on a similar level at the regional scale, people have looked at how well climate, different climate models shown in the left hand side reproduce features of interest. So this, the, the, the monsoon, for example, um, or uh, circulation patterns and storm tracks across Europe or uh, teleconnection patterns across Africa and and the color coding here basically denotes the scale of the biases in in these different climate models from the CMIP5 ensemble. Um, again, this paper by McSweeney et al is is a fantastic uh, reference to look at to give you a sense of where certain climate models have um, biases which would raise significant um, questions in your mind about whether or not we should do any downscaling from them and you can see in the final column the models have been color coded to denote whether or not the, the biases are satisfactory uh, significant 
or indeed whether the, the models are regarded as implausible, in which case you would you would really think twice about downscaling from these particular climate models. It, it amazes me actually how um, relatively few uh, published studies that use downscale that apply downscaling consider these 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 very gross issues of climate model bias as the first step. Another thing we need to sort of keep in mind, um, a problem is, you know, if there are no data on the ground, uh, then we're going to be struggling to build a conventional statistical downscaling model. And this is a graphic showing the global distribution of reporting stations and the density of those stations and you can see that most of the weather stations globally are located in Europe, North America, um, parts of Australasia and um, e e East Asia but there are vast swathes of the planet where we have very little observational data to build a um, downscaling model and so we may need to use different techniques to use satellite information combined with um, information about the terrain, the landscape, the topography to estimate conditions locally. Or we might um, install equipment to, to set up um, um, a, a short-lived observational field campaign to gather data in a particular environment where we really need um, some information on the ground. But the lack of data globally remains a, um, a, a significant obstacle for those of us who are seeking to apply statistical downscaling. And the, the length of the data sets and the quality of the data sets also matter. Here we showed um, for two locations how the, the error of the downscaled um, daily mean temperature depends on the length of record that we had available to calibrate the downscaling model. So if we just look at Tunis, for example, we can see that if we've only got uh, five years of record, then our root mean squared error is about two degrees Celsius. Whereas if we have 20 years of record, it comes down to uh, 1.8, degrees or thereabouts. So there's a there's a, an improvement. It's not a huge improvement. It's a marginal improvement, um, depending on the, the length of the record. But also you can see that the uncertainty bound, bounds, the uncertainty range in the downscaling reduces as we have this um, longer record. And people are often asking me when they're setting up a downscaling study, Rob, how many years of data do I need to build my downscaling model? And of course, the, the answer is as many years as you can lay your hands on. But I think this sort of analysis shows you that um, about 10 years of, of daily data gives you most of the, the explanatory power that you're, you would hope for if the climate is uh, reasonably stationary. So I often think 10 years is a, is a good rule of thumb in terms of the amount of data that, that you need to, to build a credible downscaling model at the daily scale. Um, in previous workshops, I've really stressed that the need to concentrate on quality assurance and checking the data that from the weather information that we're using to build the downscaling. And uh, later today, we'll be looking at some, some tests such as the day of week test. Is there a bias where, for example, there are fewer rain days being measured on the weekend, which affects the size of the rainfall amounts measured on the start of the week? Or as we see here, do the observers have biases towards certain numbers that are divisible by five or ten? And this is a this is an incredibly common bias that we see uh, all over the planet. So humankind seems to like numbers that 
end in zero or five. We just can't help ourselves. We like numbers like that. We like, we like numbers like 20 better than we like numbers 19, for example, or 21. That's just how we are. And we see this in observational data all over the planet. Um, we also need to have a, a sense of how conditions are changing at the site of interest. This is a, a study that I did uh, quite a few years ago for looking at the potential impacts of climate change on the ski industry in Colorado. So for that, we want to be able to model temperature and rainfall and from that the extent of the snow cover and the length of the snow season. And what we're looking at here is the ability to model temperature at this uh, ski resort uh, in, in winter, spring, summer and uh, autumn. And you can see overall the downscaling model, which is shown in the red, does a pretty good job of simulating the observed temperature at this uh, ski resort, except for this particular year here where there's for, there's a really big error in the downscaling. So that caused us to then go back to the data and, and look at it in more detail. And we determined that this particular year was um, a, a, an El Nino event, which was a very strong one, which led to a huge amount of snowfall in the mountains, which persisted through the spring and even into the summer. So these sites where we were trying to model the, the summer temperature, which normally had no snow cover in this particular year, had a snow, had snow cover, which was why the temperatures were, were lower than expected by the, the downscaling model. So even something like the presence or absence of snow cover on the ground in this case was affecting the, the temperatures simulated in some seasons. There are ways in which we can resolve that sort of error once we've picked it up, but it again it shows the importance of looking at and thinking about why the results are different to, to expected from the downscaling model. Also, um, for urban environments, modeling temperatures or the strength of the urban heat island uh, especially over multiple decades, we might see strong trends in the urban temperatures. And we're not sure whether or not those trends are due to climate change or whether in this case, it's due to the rapid expansion of the urban area, <clears throat> excuse me, and the a, a strengthening of the urban heat island. So, um, we might want to detrend the data first in this case before we fit the downscaling model. The detrending is being in, is intended to remove the the long term growth of the city and how that's impacted the the temperature um, uh, trend. So that what we're left with is just the, the the change in temperature that is due to the climate conditions rather than being driven also by the changes in the underlying land surface. Again, a cautionary remark here is that downscaling into um, uh, urban environments is a, isn't it, is a very, very demanding thing uh, to do. So um, if, if you're interested in modeling future climate changes in urban environments, then you're, you're stepping forward to take on some really big challenges in the downscaling work. But I'm, I'm happy to talk about some of the things I've learned over the years about the do's and don'ts of, of modeling urban environments. Um, so just sort of again, we're nearly there for the for the break now. Um, when when does downscaling add value? That it's, it's always important to keep that question in your mind. Um, is the effort of this downscaling worth it compared with using a coarser resolution information from the climate model or existing data sets such as uh, Cordex? What's the value added by the exercise? And these two papers, again, if you 
you click on the links, it will take you directly to these papers. Um, are, are nice sort of essays or discussions of um, why we should be thinking about the value added and, and why uh, some downscaling techniques might not be giving us, uh, giving us enough in return for the effort that we're putting into them. Just a few final slides then to signal when I think it's worth the effort. Um, I think it's worth the effort of downscaling if we, we want to do a, a rapid climate risk assessment at a local site, an individual catchment, an urban area, um, a region where we're interested in the agricultural. In this case, we're interested in changes in um, conditions that af affect a particular crop. So undertaking rapid risk assessments, it's very helpful. Downscaling is really helpful if we're trying to model things that we can't necessarily get directly from a global climate model. So in this case, I'm showing um, changes in the strength of London's urban heat island. So the effect of the urban area on the, the higher than the expected temperatures in the centre of the city, that's something that wouldn't be captured by most climate models, yet we can simulate thing indicators like that using downscaling. Or in, the, in this same paper, I showed how you could downscale ozone or other pollutants. We might be interested in how the pollutant concentration in London varies under different climate conditions and how that might change in the future, assuming constant emissions. So wherever we're, we're trying to um, study something like a variable that you can't directly get from a global climate model, uh, downscaling can be a, a, a helpful choice. And also at the last workshop, I really stress the utility of these tools for patching up, repairing and extending records. So here you can see um, for a record in Tunis, in Tunisia, the summer temperatures, so the, um, the thin black line is the observed uh, maximum, and the grey thick line is the statistical downscaling model. And you can see that the observed record has some gaps in it. Um, and you can see how the statistical downscaling can be used to um, reconstruct what we think our best estimate might be of the climate conditions where there were no data. Or we can zoom in and look at the same approach um, here for an individual year where the thick dark uh, black line denotes the observations which have got lots of missing days and the gray lines denote the statistical downscaling. So for those of you who want to perform really long simulations, but you might only have 10 years of data. The statistical downscaling can be calibrated on the data you have and then be used to reconstruct conditions for earlier years, allowing us to do very long-term simulations of the systems of interest. And then finally, um, this is a point that I'm going to really stress in the the, the final session of the day is that we can use statistical downscaling to test how different adaptation options perform. We can use the generated scenarios to what we say stress test a system, see how a physical system performs under plausible climate conditions with and without adaptation. And this is a this the study by Whitehead et al was one of the first where we we demonstrated this this potential, and in this particular study, we were interested in how different measures to control nitrogen runoff from agricultural land, how those different um, conservation measures would work in a changed climate condition. So, if we do nothing 
the red line suggests that nitrogen concentra nitrate concentrations rise through time as the soil is being flushed by extreme events um, and, other, and other factors. If we, for example, which dramatically reduce the amount of fertilizer, then we see the, the benefit shown in the yellow. If we um, create some wetlands to soak up the, the excess nitrate, then we see the pattern in green. But the point is that we're seeing how these different interventions might behave over the, the whole of this century based on the downscaled climate conditions. So evaluating which of those measures or combinations of measures like we see in the purple produce, the, um, produce an effective result. So give us the, the outcome that we want from our adaptation. So I'm conscious that that's a lot of time with me speaking this morning. Um, I've got a couple of minutes of questions and then we will um, take a break to set up the downscaling model and begin the, the first walkthrough of the practicals. So does anyone um, have any questions based on what you've heard so far? Uh, there is nothing in the chat. So please, if anybody has any question, just type it in the chat or unmute your microphone and ask, please. No, nothing. Okay, well, let, let's be kind to ourselves and give us a 15 minute break okay. to stretch our legs, get some coffee in the system. And, yeah. and um, Liliana, if you could um, help everyone to ensure that the um, downscaling model is, is up and running, we will start with the, the practical exercise. And I'm hoping that um, through the practical exercise, all of the theoretical stuff that I've been talking about um, so far will be become much clearer. We will reinforce some of the points that I've made. Okay, so I think it's uh, your time now, it's 10.30, is that right? Yeah, yeah. So, so let's meet back at 10.45, your okay. time, and we'll begin the practical then, okay? Okay. okay. All right. See you shortly. Yeah. Um, some of the data sets. Uh, are, are you able to um, see the observed data, for example? There's an, there's an observed data file in the directory. In the S DSM materials, you, you can find Excel data and um, Take stay data. Confirm link ones though, Just Please confirm me if you can see those. If you go to the directory, there's a there should be three folders: one for SGSM, one for readings, and one for I think um, I'm trying to remember what the other one, the slides. So if you if you if you look in the SGSM folder, you should see an Excel file that contains the raw data that um, we're going to be looking at today. And, then, and if, if you're able to find that, then you can at least participate in that part of the, the exercise. Um, yes, there is that material. Mm -hmm. I saw 1961, okay, so. Nobody's objecting, so maybe no one's yeah. objecting. So maybe shall I answer. shall I continue? <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, please. Yeah. All right then. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean because um, uh, SGSM is not you know uh, um, official software as such. Um, it may it may be that institutional firewalls and and so forth. Um, prevent you as a user installing this without the, the appropriate levels of authorization. So it might be that you need to speak with your um, administrator who can help install the, 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 the software for you, who has the rights to do that. 
Um, nonetheless, I, I, I've put together these slides which will guide you through the process of the model, um, model building. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering whether, uh, Biana, for the folk who aren't able to run the software, if they're able to somehow um, sit on your shoulder in your on your workshop and work, you know, you you work through with them interactively. You share share what you're you're seeing on the screen with them as we go through the exercises. So at least we bring everyone into the the exercise. Would that be possible? Yeah, yeah. I can I can share my screen. No problem. When we yeah. start. So what I'll what I'll do is that when we come to those steps those parts in the exercise i will stop sharing my screen and then you'll be in charge to okay. to share what you can see as okay. a as a participant with the the others does okay. that make sense to everyone yeah okay all right then well um as i say this is always um difficult to do remotely ideally we would have all been in the same laboratory at Loughborough with the same systems having the, having the same experience um, and and these sorts of technical issues would be resolved a, ahead of time but here we go so we're going to be talking about the practicalities of applying SGSM to downscale precipitation and as I mentioned at the start today those of you who are interested in temperature, there is the, I think, a, um, a set of slides and talks available on the Extreme Klim Twin website, capturing the, the temperature downscaling workshop. So you can see how, how that's done as well, if you're interested. Um, so today, Today we're going to be using um, SGSM version 5.2. That's the one that you you hopefully have been able to install. Uh, the date stamp here is the 3rd of December 2015. Um, developments have been going on with SGSM in the in the last six years, and we're aiming to launch the um, version six early in in January next year and this new version will have additional functions for checking the quality of the data and looking at the stationarity of long-term records it also has the capability to downscale sub-daily information and for those of you who are interested in hydrological applications it has functions to enable the generation of intensity duration frequency curves and I'll, I'll just demonstrate that towards the end of the session to, to tease you into and to encourage you into down, downloading this later version when it becomes released. Um, before we get down to the practicalities, uh, I always like to highlight some of the underpinning papers that describe the, uh, the algorithms in SGSM. <clears throat> for those of you who want to have a deeper understanding of how this model actually is built, how it, how it works and how it performs when it's been rigorously tested. So the very first paper, nearly 20 years ago, um, describes the, uh, one of the initial versions of the model. The 2014 paper describes uh, the version that you're working with at the, at the moment, which is, a, is somewhat of a departure from the earlier versions. And the rationale for the, the, the model and how it is used is explained in this paper with some worked examples. Um, there are, for those of you who are interested in downscaling rainfall and heavy rainfall, there are these two papers, which I've mentioned already. The, the analysis of Haylock et al. Is, is a good one to look at because it shows you how you go about evaluating lots of different downscaling models and the range of diagnostics or tests that you can use to check a downscaling model's performance. 
And then the Gonzali uh, Roji uh, paper I mentioned also is this sort of comparison of the statistical downscaling with the dynamical downscaling model WARF and, and shows and explains how hard it is to actually design a fair comparison of two very different um, downscaling tools. It's like, how do, how do you fairly compare whether an apple or an orange is better? That's essentially what this paper tries to, to explain. Um, again, before we get into the detail, it's helpful to have an understanding of the overarching architecture of the downscaling model. And um, it, it's easiest to think of it in terms of the main screens within the downscaling model, the um, inputs to the model and the tasks that the model is actually performing. So there are about 10 main screens shown in, in the red, which are, take us all the way through from quality control to the selection of variables, the calibration of the model, the simulation of scenarios. And then a lot of effort has gone into developing screens for frequency analyses, the comparison of, of results and statistical analysis of the output from the the modeling. Um, the, the, the step that we're going to be spending most of our time on is around the screen variables. Um, and this is where we are trying to decide which predictor variables you, to use to build the statistical downscaling model. So you can see that right at the top of the workflow, we're feeding in the observed data sets we're doing our quality control, and then we're bringing those data sets alongside reanalyses variables. These are climate, um, essentially large-scale climate variables taken from the NSEP reanalysis. So that's a, a pseudo weather model that assimilates data from all around the world and gives gridded information that we can use at the large scale to downscale to the local scale. Um, though those data have already been pre-prepared for you and I'll explain where you can obtain this information and that's brought alongside the observed data to build the statistical transfer functions which we then calibrate. After that ev everything else moves very quickly through the analysis and uh, simulation of the downscaled outputs. Um, again, just for, for rigor at the outset, there are five, essentially five different types of file that the downscaling tool uses. So um, those ending in dot data are essentially uh, observed uh, data that are used for um, calibrating the model. The PAR file is the file containing the parameters when the model has been calibrated. And I always say to, um, to, to, to people that if ever you have problems with, with the downscaling model, if you send me the PAR file, this allows me to very quickly diagnose any um, obvious problems with your model setup or the way in which you've built the model. So this, the PAR file, as well as being the, the engine of the model that generates all of the scenarios, it's also um, a very useful resource for diagnosing problems with the, with the model set up and running. And then the sim and the dot out files are created by the, the weather generator and the scenario steps. And then um, there are a whole range of T, TXT files that are produced um, from analyses of the of the downscaling model output and to enable the, ma the the maximum flexibility and the portability of SDSM much of the information that is taken into and produced by the tool is generated in ASCII format so we're keeping it as simple as possible um, and that's one reason why this 
tool has, I think, been able to operate for nearly 20 years on all sorts of different versions of, of Windows and so forth because it's using very uh, simple input and output um, formats for, it, for data, but that will be made clear as, uh, later on. Um, also in, your, in the online folder, you'll find this 20 step primer sheet, which literally guides you through one step at a time through the downscaling process and that's exactly what we're going to be doing today is I'm going to take you through those 20 steps right from the very beginning to the end that you should find that pdf file in the folder and um, as I go through the slides I'll be referring to, to the, the step numbers here so having that two-sided sheet to one side um, you'll be able to follow or use it like a map to, to follow through the workflow. Okay. Um, just to, again, to um, let those who, who weren't present at the temperature downscaling workshop know, I'm, I've shown you this graphic already that um, we were modeling maximum temperatures last time. And you can see that between us, I think we produced some quite nice results that um, cal calibrated well and simulated the observed daily temperature at, at Novi Sad in the test period. And I've shown you this one already where we simulated the 2007 um, heat wave in Novi Sad. Um, what was quite remarkable from that last exercise was how well the downscaling model was also able to reproduce the marked rise in maximum temperatures through time. So this gave us a lot of confidence in the quality of the data that we used to fit the model and in the uh, robustness of the downscaling model at the same time. Now, today we're going to be focusing on um, downscaling heavy rainfall. And, and this is obviously um, a topic that attracts a lot of interest, growing interest, particularly for those who are trying to manage climate risks in urban environments. And this uh, lovely paper by Guerrero et al, 2017, shows how um, the, the the heavy rainfall varies across rainfall for get, uh, across Europe for different return periods and how they suggest that the 10 year return period heavy rainfall event is a useful diagnostic for predicting that the, the possibility of urban flooding. And the uh, map on the right shows the stations sadly not in um, Ser any in Serbia, but everywhere else around Serbia, it seems, and uh, in, in Central and Western Europe, where heavy rainfall has been assessed in terms of its, it, it, the, the amount of a city that might be flooded by a given um, rainfall intensity. And I'm aware that um, colleagues in Serbia have been using and analysing and pro provided a nice summary paper based on this, this work um, for um, Central Europe looking at heavy rainfall. So there's a lot of interest in this and in fact actually this is the, the paper I came across uh, last week which provides a, a great background synthesis of research into pluvial flooding and by pluvial flooding we're talking about heavy rainfall um, that generates very localized street level flooding as distinct from the flooding of um, cities and landscapes by uh, rivers over banking so we're looking at essentially flash flood risk in the urban environment so that's the that's a background to, to what we're trying to do today and why heavy rainfall matters. Let's now get on with the first exercise. And that is to quality assure 
the, the data that we have. In, in, your, in the online folder, you should be able to find this uh, data set, this Excel file that contains temperature and precipitation data. And what I'd like you to do is to spend a few minutes just quickly looking at the rainfall column, the data sets there, um, applying some quick visual checks, scanning the data, checking the, 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 the extreme values and so forth, looking at the data and, and thinking about inequality issues and what tests you might perform to really check the quality of the data and what other information would you like to have but we haven't given you today to judge the quality of the of the data does that all make sense okay so um let's let's spend 10 minutes so we'll come back at um 20 past 11 your time ten, just 10 minutes to to look at that file hopefully everyone has been able to obtain it okay so we got something going on in the chat oh yeah great thank you minute chair that's great all right If there are any um, questions as you're looking at the data, then just put them in the chat box or activate your microphone. I'll, I'll be sitting here waiting to help.
missing data? No, no missing data, apparently. <laughs> but I think um, we always we always need to be mindful of the fact that sometimes missing data can be entered as a as a zero. Um, so I'm not saying this is the case with this record, but sometimes when you we have a record that looks 100% complete, it may be that missing data have been registered as a, as a zero as a, as opposed to some other code. We can't necessarily rule that out at this this point but at the moment it looks at face value that we've got a 100 percent complete rainfall record for the period 61 to 2020 okay what what else have we found i have found some 999 values where you I'm have assuming that could be missing data okay so it, was that in the temperature record or in the rainfall record in the temperature min yeah and yeah and the temperature mean i think yeah okay all right so we've got missing data in the in the temperature record but we're looking okay in the rainfall now what what are, what sorts of values are we seeing in the rainfall record and do we believe them uh, we found actually the, the largest value of uh, 121.9 millimeters yep. and that in 2015 in May, which is quite strange because uh, uh, we had the highest precipitation in May of 2014. The day before uh, that highest values, we have 0 0.3 and the day after we have, I don't know, 2.5. Millimeters, so this is unreasonably high value. Yeah. Two two small values. Yeah. So I so for everyone else, I'm sure everyone um, hopefully managed to find the largest value in the data set, which um, was this 121.9 millimeters on the 25th of May, yeah. 2015. Now. I thought that an amount of rainfall like that, if that fell on Novi Sad, I would assume there'd be some flooding and some record in the media of flooding. So I did my best to search the internet for any pictures, newspaper records, any account of flooding on that day, and I couldn't find any. And it may be that simply um, from where I am, I can't access that, that kind of information. But does anyone who's lived in the city uh, during that period, do you remember any any extreme event on that particular day or any, has there ever been any flooding in Novi Sad? Uh, on 2015, no, but on 2014, we had a large amount of rainfall uh, in, I don't know, three or four days in, in May 2014, but we didn't have yeah. floodings. Yeah. OK, so you see the importance of this, because we're later on, we're going to be building a statistical model based on this information. And if we're going to concentrate on extremes and we've got an extreme event and we've only looked at the very largest one that uh, we can't independently corroborate um, <clears throat> either against local memory or um, records in the papers. Um, then we've got a little bit of a, an anxiety in the back of our minds. So let's let's hang on to that thought. Do we trust that extreme value? Um, could it have been caused by something else? That's an open question. Any 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 other observations on the data set? Excuse me. <clears throat> Okay, well, let me just, um, I, I gave myself probably an hour to look at the, the data using some, some little tools that I've already um, pre-prepared, which I can perhaps share with participants after the event as a handy tool. And I'll, I'll just show you some of the things that came to light when I took longer than 10 minutes to look at the data set, okay? But before I do, before I do that, um, 
Do we do we have any other information that would be useful? Sorry, Rob, we are just discussing the 25th of May as what, what happened on the 25th of May. But the values before and after this high value is quite small. So I think that we should also consider that. Okay. Do we, um, I, do we know what day of the week the 25th of May was? Just a second. 25th of May, does it? It was uh, Monday. Ah, so. Evo ima na grad Novi Sad, je zasedao gradski štab za vanredne situacije zbog padavina. So we have some uh, archive news that the, uh, what, what is that called, the, the Council for Extreme Events was uh, convening that day, I think. I don't know. <laughs> yes. Okay, so I think um, so I think we need to with an event like this, we need to try and you know a, a, an outlier like this, do what we can to corroborate it, either from uh, local memory, uh, um, media records, official records, or better still, um, any um, meta information from the weather station. So what I would really love to see is if if this is a manual record, can we can we see the handwritten records from the observer? So do do we can we go back to the primary data and, and check this? And this is something that I've done in the in the past working in other countries where there's been some concern or questions raised around some of the extreme events it's very useful to take the time to go back to the reporting agency and say um can you can you just send me the the raw data files um for this particular day because um it 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 we, we got some questions and concerns about it so uh, do not be afraid to seek out other information to test the the, the the truth of a of a value, but here's um, you know some uh, some other checks that we can we can perform on the data. So a Monday, and we'll come back to that. Um, I, you saw that I was uh, laughing when I heard it was a Monday because uh, there, there might be a good reason then why why the big day occurred on on a Monday. Oh. But we see that the um, annual totals vary between about 300 millimeters and a thousand millimeters. So there's a, a lot of variation from one year to the next in the amount of rainfall. Does that match with your local experience? No, I'm not sure. Yes. So we're okay. All right. Um, number three, we see there are no missing data, but as I suggested earlier, um, we can't rule out the fact that zeros, not all zeros are necessarily dry days. Some of those zeros could be missing data. I'm not saying that this is the case for this station, but it's always a possibility. Another interesting check is to look for possible duplicate values in the series. This is when you get the same unusual value recorded two days in a row. So for example, we see that a value of 18 millimeters occurred on the 19th and 20th of June, 1992. Um, now, there's all, always a statistical chance that 18 millimeters will happen on two successive days, but it's, I think it's a very, very small chance and duplicate values can be um, a useful check of a data entry issue. So, for example, the when the manual data have been um, digitized, someone may have inadvertently put the same value in twice in two days. Okay, 
So that's a useful check. And then other checks that we can perform are, um, as I showed last time, the day of week, the number bias, the petite homogeneity test, which I'll show you in a minute, and we might compare with the nearest uh, stations that uh, Liana gave me to, to work with. Um, but then I think, you know, having information about the, the weather station itself, and I'm not sure how, how easy though, those, that information is to access, um, but that's always a very helpful um, starting point. Here, I've done some extra analysis looking at the day of the week. So we've got the frequency of wet days shown here, which, um, you know, there's not that much variation here, but no consistent pattern by the day of the week. So that looks OK. Um, frequency of days that are bigger than 25 millimetres, um, that looks OK. The mean rainfall. Um, peaking in, in Wednesdays, but slightly lower on the on the weekend and Friday. Um, you know, that's okay, probably OK. But then we see this tendency for very heavy rain days on the Monday. Um, and that can sometimes be suggestive of um, Saturday and Sunday being bulked or multiple days over the weekend being recorded as one day on, on, the, on the Monday. And, and that's why I, I, I was smiling when I heard that the heaviest ever rainfall was on a Monday. I'm, I'm not saying I've got no evidence to say that that was caused by rainfall occurring on more than one day being recorded on Monday, but this is a very common uh, thing seen many in many stations all over the world where um, the values have been bulked up. Okay, so we've got someone on the chat there. Yes, uh, I sent uh, the news report and uh, it was actually on the on the Sunday, Sunday evening. So it was probably recorded as uh, in Monday because it was <clears throat> after seven o'clock in the evening. So, Excellent. Uh, thank you very much for doing that because that also it underlines the point I made earlier about how the, re the reporting time can be misleading because if it if it fell within that you know if you're reporting rainfall at seven in the morning from the previous 24 hours it can be linked to the to the wrong day so to in a sense to the monday rather than the sunday when the rainfall actually occurred and that can be a source of uncertainty when we're building the um, statistical downscaling model does that make sense sure Okay, good. So we're learning stuff together here, and I'm definitely going to check out that uh, that link to, to see what happened on the Sunday. Okay, let's just click this one. And this is again this this number bias um, where we do see uh, a tendency in manual records for certain favored numbers. And I've highlighted in red here the the, the numbers ending in zero. So um, observers at this site like numbers like 1.0 millimeters more than they like 0.9 and 1.1 because you can see lower values on either side. And that carries on all the way through up to about 10 millimeters. There is a, there's evidence of a number bias. Now, because we're interested on in the extreme values, um, the the 510 number bias issue is not so much a concern um, of greater concern is the day of the week bias, for example, if multiple days have been combined. And I think thanks to the news report, we've got more confidence in the extreme values because we found independent evidence for a very heavy rain day. Um, on, on that particular day. The homogeneity test um, using petite looks for a step change in a record to see if there's been a marked break from one part of the record compared with another. And it's a rank-based approach. 
um, and identifies the year where there's the, the maximum change in the average between two sub periods in a record. So if we look at the annual rainfall total for, for Novi Sad, we can see um, the average is about 600 millimeters until the mid 1990s. And then there's a step change um, in the latter part of the record. So apparently, according to this, um, there's been an increase in the amount of annual rainfall in Novi Sad since the 19, mid 1990s. Now, it turns out that the, the size of this difference is statistically insignificant. So based on this information, we'd say, uh, based on the annual means, that it looks like it's quite a, a homogeneous um, record. We can also compare with the, um, the two neighbouring sites, um, and we get similar results here where there's no significant change in the annual mean, but we're also seeing a 510 bias in the, in the records here, um, but no day of the week bias, I think, in terms of the, the counts of very heavy days. Now we can um, apply statistical tests of the significance of these um, uh, differences by day of week or by the number bias, um, and I'm happy to explain that in more detail uh, uh, if you like. But for the time being, it looks like the the, the annual totals are are fairly stationary. But when I was looking at the data, I I wonder if you see the same thing here. I look at the latter part of the record. And I look at it and I think it looks like the variance has increased, that there's, there's greater variance in the most recent 20 years compared with the earlier record. So rather than looking at the change in the mean, I looked at ch the change in the variance. And now we see a statistically significant break point in the variance around the mid 1990s. So my question here, um, I know that this was a, a, a difficult time for the country and for the region. Did that affect the um, ability to record rainfall uh, and meteorological records? Or are we seeing that this, that has there been a change in the climate regime in the most recent 20 years? So. Uh, again, I'd welcome your thoughts on that. It seems that it fits well with uh, what we observed and uh, what the, in the last 20 years, and maybe especially in the last 10 years. So you, your sense, again, you know, ground truth in this, that the weather does seem to have become more variable in yes. um in recent decades yes, yes okay that that's very you know that's a really interesting thing so now that's going to present a, a big test for the ability of the downscaling model to to capture that shift that change in the in the in the climate regime so let's keep that in mind the other sorts of tests we can do um comparing neighboring sites is to, uh, as I've done on the left-hand side, plot the um, annual totals um, of one site against another. And you can see that by and large, they, they do agree, but there are certain outlier years. And because I think there's a fair distance between these two sites, you wouldn't expect them to be exactly the same anyway. Another thing you can do is the, the cumulative total of the rainfall at one site compared with another. And that will show whether or not there's been a, a systematic bias or drift in one station compared with another. Excuse me. <clears throat> but does, it, does anyone locally know whether or not there's been a, a move in the, the weather station at Novi Sad, or has it always been in the same location? 
No, he said no. Nothing changed. <laughs> Nothing changed. Is it at the is it at the airport or something like at an airport? No, it's um, outside. No, it's outside. It's it's not in the city. Okay, so it's on 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 the edge. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now then, um, so let, before we begin now with SDSM, um, let, let's just recap what we've learned from this exercise. We've take we've we've looked at the daily data. Uh, we found an extreme event. Uh, and initial concerns were that this was a, a false event because it was recorded on a Monday and there's often a chance that a, a large Monday value is a bolt from multiple days. But we've confirmed that there's, um, there's good evidence that that was a real event. If we had the time, we would want to check all the other annual maxima in this record to be confident that they are all robust values and there's no, no issue with the data. Um, our other observation is that the, there does appear to have been some sort of uh, change in the climatic regime um, in the most recent decade or two to more variable conditions. So, and we found that tipping point around the mid 1990s we could use that tipping point um, as, a, as one period to calibrate the model on and one period to test the model on. Because if the model can perform well after the tipping point, the break point, that's a really, really tough test of the downscaling model. Okay, does that all make sense? Any, any questions so far? I mean, Seems like we spent a lot of time on the quality assurance, but this is really this is really important because we're going to be building a statistical model, and we want to have confidence in the the data that we're being that we're using to build the model. So, any any questions or concerns so far? All right, now's the time then to to start to look at. Um, the, the, the preliminary tasks for working with SDSM. So if you have your um, two page uh, primer sheet, then in step one, you'll see that, uh, that a key task is to get the, the data in SDSM format. And this is the weather station data. And, and as I said before, the, the data format that we use is ASCII, to keep it nice and simple. The NoviSAD file um, begins in 1st of January 1961, whereas the standard start date in STSM is the 1st of January 1948. And the reason it's 1st of January 1948 is this is the first day where, where we have the reanalysis data. These are the large scale atmospheric predictive variables that we're going to be using to build the model. They be all begin in January, 1948. So that means that if we've got um, a data set that's, that begins later than 1st of January, 1948, we have to um, pad the file with the correct number of um, missing data values, which for convenience, I suggest you use minus 999. And then you'll see uh, 0.2 millimeters was the first value in the, in the file and, and so forth. And again, to save time, I've done this for you. And if you look in the folder, you should see um, a, a text file called NoviSAD PREC. OBS TXT, which is pre-prepared for you, where I've, I've buffered the missing data with minus 999. Can everyone see that data set? Yes. Right? Thanks. Okay, good. So that's step, step one, only 19 more steps to go. <laughs> Step two then is to obtain the uh, downscaling predictive variables. And again, we've made this as simple as possible for users through the 
uh, SGSM portal, if you go to this particular page, you type in the longitude and the latitude of the site that you want. And then it uh, generates the uh, grid box for the, the, the nearest weather station. So, sorry, the, it, it generates the grid, the grid box that is closest to the, to the latitude and longitude of your weather station. And it does that automatically. It creates um, a file called box something or other dot zip. And again, if you look in the resources online in the folder under the SDSM subfolder that we've set up for you, you should see a, a file called with box dot something or other zip. Can everyone see that? Good. All right. Um, there is also a, um, a, a standard sheet that um, is helpful to remind you what all the, the predictor variable codes are, because in the zip file, there are about 40 predictor variables that you can use to, to build your downscaling model. Um, and sometimes it's hard to remember what the, the letter coding of these different variables is. Um, so the first column in this reference file, this predictor sheet, again, which you can obtain through this um, um, hyperlink, um, provides you with the code, the description of the variable, the units, and how this particular variable was um, derived. Some of the predictor variables are based on three grid cells around the target box. So they're based on a, an array of um, nine cells. Others are, are a single value, uh, such as the, the, the amount of precipitable wa uh, water over the exact grid cell that you're working from. So that just gives you a little bit of detail. Before I go any further, does, does everyone understand what I'm talking about when I'm, I'm making the distinction between the predictor variable and the predictand? So the predictor variable is one of these large scale atmospheric variables and the predictand is the thing we're trying to model, which today is precipitation. Does everyone follow that distinction? All good, okay. Um, and here I'm giving you a few hints on, um, you know, which, which sorts of variables in that um, predictor set might be helpful for modeling rainfall. Well, there are some here that were designed specifically for capturing extreme rainfall. So the surface lifted index is, uh, is measuring the, the um, temperature difference between uh, um, um, a parcel of air as it's moving up through the atmosphere. So it's capturing um, a combination of temperature and, and humidity in this index. But the potential temperature index as well is measuring how well a parcel of air can move up or down. So it's, these, are, these are variables that are giving us a, a sense of the vertical motion of an air parcel and the likelihood that it will rise up and generate heavy rainfall. The precipitable water is the amount of water in the column above the site. If we squeezed out all of the, all of the moisture in that column, that would be the amount of water. Um, and then the precipitation, uh, the PREC variable is the actual rainfall amount um, estimated by the reanalysis system. And I just put this in the table because there is some debate in the downscaling community as to whether we should be using reanalysis precipitation to downscale local precipitation. So uh, is there some sort of double counting going on there? Um, is that a legitimate thing to do? And I've, I've talked to quite some length with climate modelers about this and they 
generally say that they think it's okay because the reanalysis system is um, modeling precipitation using uh, the laws of physics, whereas other variables like temperature in the system are to a large extent due to the data that's being assimilated from weather stations. The precipitation value in reanalysis has not been assimilated from observed data. It's purely generated by the, the reanalysis system itself. So I take, you know, I trust the climate modelers when they tell me that it's okay to use this to, to downscale rainfall. I just highlight that, that there is there are some, some nuances. Um, Step three is a quick one, it's just to check that, assuming you're able to download to your local um, um, you know, computer that you've got the, the most recent, well, the current version. And as I say, we will be planning to issue a, a, the next version in January 2022. But pretty much everything I'm describing to you today will still be true in January 2020. The, the next version just has a few extra um, uh, levels of functionality for modeling extreme events, especially for rainfall. Excellent. So now's the, now's the time to um, get to the, um, to, 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 to run the downscaling model on your laptops if you're able to. And you are looking at the main screen here. Um, what I will do is just, I think we've just got about six or seven minutes, I think, before the lunch break. So I'll just go through the preliminaries of the model setup. And then if I can speak with the local team about how after lunch we're going to do the, the demo. Is that OK? Yes. Yeah. OK, good. Um, so if, you could, if you're able to see the main screen, um, you'll see highlighted here in the red is a, is a settings button, which um, helps us set the software up. So it's finding the files on your com local computer from the, the, the right um, folders and paths. Mm -hmm. So to make the model um, and software run as smoothly as possible. The other thing to note is that you can see that you've got these big buttons along the top, which with the arrows on them, and these essentially take you like a chain step by step through the process. So we're sort of starting at the top left and moving right, going through this process as a general rule. Now you can jump around from one part of the software to another, no problem, but when we're first setting up the model, just keep in mind that it's this general chain of one task moving to the next, to the next, to the next. So if, if you're able to go to the settings screen, you'll see um, the setup like this. And there's a couple of things I want you, to, I want to highlight. Has, has the local team been able to get, can you see the settings? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, all right. Yes, it's not All right. So in the settings, um, we the most important thing is to make sure that we have the, the full date range here. Now, this first day is 1948. Mm -hmm. And here I'm setting the end date as 2017. And I know that your data go to 2020, but the predictor variables run out in 2017. So that's why we set this at 2017 as the last year, 31st of December, 2017. Now, the other thing to note is before when we were modeling temperature, um, of course you can have negative temperatures and you can have positive temperatures. But I think we'd be a bit worried if we had negative rainfall. So we need to uh, unclick the box here. So we're not allowing negative values in our model. And we're setting the event 
threshold of the model to zero. So we're saying any value other than zero, we're treating as a, a rain day. Now there is, <clears throat> depending on where you're working in the in the world, sometimes some places like in the US, the, the threshold for a rain day might be a hundredth of one inch. In some, um, some countries, the threshold for a rain day is one millimeter. So anything less than one millimeter is regarded as a, as a trace, day, trace rainfall day or a dry day. So we would set that threshold for one. But I think you've got, you know, lots of data like 0 0.1, 0 0.2. So we're just saying any value that is non-zero, we're treating as a rain day. So we're setting the event threshold at zero. And then finally, what you need to do is to set up the directory um, to um, um, find the pathway in the bottom here containing your predictor variable box once you've un unzipped it. So I like to keep all of my down SGSM model sites in one folder and I've got so a folder called SGSM and I, I have a separate folder for each station. And then I've got the box here. And the disk we are. And that that contains the um, predictor variables um, that have been unzipped. Okay. Now, um, we will be coming back to uh, uh, setting the ad advanced settings later on. And when, we, when I have to explain something else that's special about rainfall modeling, rainfall modeling is more complicated than temperature modeling because we're simulating both the occurrence of a rain day, whether it's dry or wet, and secondly, whether or not, uh, sorry, secondly, the amount of rainfall. So it's it's a much more complicated um, model to, 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 to build, and we have to take a few just little extra steps along the way compared with what we did with, with temperature, but I'll explain that later. Okay, I think that's, um, a, a, probably a good place to pause for um, lunch for you guys. It's a little bit earlier for here. I might I might have an early lunch here. <laughs> um, and I think what time are we due to come back? It's half past one. No? Half past one, I think. Half past one your time. Half past yeah. twelve UK time. Yeah. We return yeah. from lunch. Yeah. Um, and yeah, if I can just chat with the local team and we'll just see how we're going to make this, uh, this practical work for everyone who might not have been able to download and install SGSM. All right, but if we, if we pause there, are there any questions so far? We don't have anything in the chat. And um... Nobody's <laughs> complaining or. Okay. All right. Well, then, if everyone else would like to go and enjoy their lunch or uh, have a late breakfast, um, we will we will just talk for a few minutes now, Biliana, if we can, about how we'll handle the the, the next steps. Okay. Yeah. And then Rob, we, we cannot see. Oh, now we can see. Of the door, I can watch mine. That's it. Sorry. Okay, is everyone good? Yeah. All right, it, 
Perhaps we uh, mute your end just until um, we go to the exercise, if that's okay. okay. Great, thank you. All right, well, welcome back everyone. Um, uh, we're going to do the best we can with a mix of um, on hands, hands on um, SDSM work in Serbia shared with everyone else who hasn't been able to install the software. And I've set a, a number of exercises to guide us through this process. And um, for those of you who had difficulty installing the software, if you look at the slides, number th three, there's a, there's a set of slides, number three, which is the one that I'm going to be working through. So you at least have um, a hard copy of, of what I'm showing at the moment. You can make notes on that as we go along. I know it's not as good as being able to do the hands-on, but it's probably the best we can do under the circumstances. Okay, so um, just to recap, we, we've got 20 steps to, to, go, to go through from right at the beginning of um, quality assuring and checking that our files are in the right format through to the de development of the downscaling model, its application, and then ultimately um, analyzing the output of the downscaling tool. So before lunch, we just got to step four where we had just set up the tool with some basic information about the date range and our definition of a wet day and where we're going to find data files in our local architecture. So next step is to go through this quality control exercise, which is the slide, you, you, you click on the button quality control at the top, then you click on select file and um, choose the file that I pre-prepared for you, which is called Novisad Prec OBS. That's the observed daily data beginning in 1948. And then if you click on check file, you should get a screen uh, looking like this. Now, this provides us with a very quick check of the the types of values within the file. So you can see the 121.9, which we talked about this morning, and various other indicators of how many values there are and so forth. So as well as checking the data, this step is also helpful in confirming that your local settings are able to read the files correctly and that they're, they're handling the data okay. There may be some local issues if, for example, your um, protocol is to use um, a comma in, in place of a decimal point, but you can adjust that in the global, global settings um, for Windows if need be. So, um, yeah. Liliana, if, if you've got that, you, you're good, I'll move on because then we can go to the, the exercise shortly. Uh, to, there, just to highlight that there are these other functions within SDSM that enable us to transform data in various ways. So often we're making assumptions about the distribution, that it may be normally distributed or there may be outliers that are problematic. And in any case, we can apply a range of transformations to the data to help with the model fitting. We're not going to be doing that today, but this just allows greater flexibility of modeling all sorts of different types of data distribution. Now, um, steps six to eight in your primer sheet are all about screening the variables. And this is the, this is the, I always say, this is the screen on which you will probably spend most of your time when you're developing a downscaling model with SGSM. So we get to it through this screen variables button. Um, we select the predict and file again that we just checked. So Novisad Prec OBS. We set the date range here, 1961 
to 31st of 12, 1994. So why are we choosing 1994 when we know we've got data right through to 2017? Any ideas? Well, the, remember before the break that we detected a potential change in the climate regime around 1994-95 when we see a, a, an increase in the variability of the data. Um, and so we're going to set the model up to do this very tough test whereby we're going to calibrate the model on the, the first 34 years of data, 1961 to 94. And then we're going to test the model on data between 1995 and 2017, i.e. the period after the step change. So that's a really, going to be a really, really tough test of the downscaling model, knowing that there's this shift in the regime. The next thing we have to do is to select the um, the box containing the downscaling predictor variables. And you have to sort of click on your local architecture, your lo local file structure until you get to NoviSAD, click, click on the box, and then it should open up and provide you with a list of all of the predictor variables. Okay. Um, and here, just for illustrative purposes, I've highlighted the first seven predictor variables. And you're, you're able to select a maximum of 12 predictor variables at any one time. Um, I, I strongly advise you not to build a model with 12 predictor variables. Um, you, you want to be trying to build a model that is as parsimonious as possible. And I just think as a rule of thumb, somewhere around maximum five or six predictor variables. If you have more than that put into your model, then there's a danger that you are overfitting to the, to the data, okay? Now we are um, building a rainfall model, which means we need to cl click on the conditional box here, which is, um, ensuring that we are making a separation between the occurrence of rainfall, whether it's wet or dry, a dry day, and the amount of rainfall. So we have this two-step model. So during calibration and during the, um, the, during the screening variables and during the calibration step, it's important that we have this conditional button clicked to ensure that we're building a, a credible model. Then before we get to the exercise, just a few examples of what you should, you should be able to see. So if you click on the, um, having set this up and you click on the, um, the correlation box, up here, the, the correlation button, then you'll get a matrix like this, which will come up and it will show you the correlation between your target variable, which is the rainfall at Novisad, related to, in this case, the first seven predictor variables that I highlighted in the previous screen. And remember as well, right at the start of the day, I was talking about the amount of, um, of, of correlation, the unique correlation from each variable or the partial R, and that's shown here. And if the value is less than uh, the p-value, the significance value is less than 0 0.005, then we, we, we're quite happy that this is providing unique information. The other button that you can click on is the scatter button. Um, and this will produce um, graphics like this, which you can change the season, 
the variables that you're relating. So this is the one I showed this morning where we were looking at the correlation between direct solar uh, radiation and maximum temperatures. But here you can see different predictive variables against the rainfall amounts. So straight away, we can, we can see from this visual inspection that modeling rainfall is not gonna be straightforward. The, the, we're not seeing the same nice linear relationships in the, in the data as before. So um, P underscore V, that variable is the strength of the wind flow from the south or the north. And it's showing a negative correlation. So the larger, um, sorry, the, the larger rainfall values up here tend to be associated with the, uh, with these um, more negative values. This one here is measuring the amount of circulation or spin in the upper or middle atmosphere, and that's showing us a weak positive correlation. And this is the relationship between the reanalysis rainfall and the local rainfall. And it's, it's hard to say what sort of relationship that is, but it underlines the fact that we should be getting some value added from the reanalysis uh, rainfall by fitting to these other variables. Okay, so um, in the reading folder, there's um, the paper here, which I've mentioned before by Gonzalez Roger, um, which is the, the Spanish downscaling study. And what you've got here is 21 stations across Spain, and across the top, you've got the different predictive variables. So I just put this up as an illustration of the number and the types of predictive variable that were commonly chosen in this Spanish study. Um, now, the, 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 the lead researcher spent a lot of time here calibrating each one of these stations. You can imagine how long that, that took him, and it took him several attempts to get the model um, in a state that he was happy. But you can see that certain predictive variables are seen in the majority of models. And like I was saying to you earlier, the majority of models only have five or six predictive variables. The other thing I'd like you to note is this column at the end, which is the amount of explained variance. Um, when we were modeling temperature, we were getting explained variances of 70 or 80 percent or even higher. Now for rainfall across these sites, it's around 20 to 30 percent. I just highlight that so you, you're not um, demoralized when you start trying to downscale rainfall because you because remember what we're trying to do. We're trying to we're trying to take information over hundreds of square kilometers and use that to predict what is happening at one little weather station in Novi Sad. Okay, so the amount of explained variance in rainfall from that large scale to local scale is not going to be as great as we get for temperature. But the other thing to note is that the amount of explained variance is only one of the diagnostics we're going to use to check the model. So the R squared is just how much of the day-to-day -day variance is captured by the downscaling. But there may be other things that are more important to us, like how well does the model capture the overall um, extreme value distribution? How well does the model capture the seasonal rainfall total and so forth? So I just say this, don't be demoralized when you find that you're getting small R squared values. It's just one way in which you can measure the performance of a model. And it's probably not the best way for, for evaluating a rainfall model that has a very large stochastic or random part to it. Okay, are there, are there any questions on that so far?
Is that, is, that, is that all clear? Okay, then it's time to move to the, the exercise. And what I'd like you to do, if you're, um, if you have SDSM installed and you're, you're working remotely, then please just work by yourself through this exercise and try and find um, the set of predictor variables that you think are most useful for downscaling rainfall at NoviSat. Okay, and you're going to be using the, the screen variables slide. And here are some, you know, some points for you to, to keep in mind. Um, try and find four, five, or six variables, or maybe seven at a push, which you think should be included in your rainfall model. Um, if you go back to this button here, you might want to switch between um, conditional and unconditional models. So the, if you have it switched on to unconditional, the model is concentrating on um, simulating wet day occurrence, whether or not um, a wet day or a dry day is predicted. If you have it clicked like here, you're testing the variables that best explain the rainfall amount. So hopefully you understand that distinction. Unconditional is for the, the, the amount of uh, the occurrence of rainfall, and conditional is the amount of rainfall. And you might want, hopefully, you're hopefully going to find sets of predictors that work for both simulating the occurrence and the amount of rainfall. Um, I'm, I'm suggesting that you don't need a, an autoregressive term here um, in, in this model, like we used in temperature, because, because the model is simulating wet day occurrence, it already has a certain amount of memory built into it. Okay, so it remembers what the previous day was and uses that to transition to either a wet or a dry day. So there's no need to click on the autoregressive term for the, the rainfall model, okay? Um, and remember the, the petite test that I showed you before lunch, that, that break point around 1994. So I'd like you to be exploring the relationships during the period 1961 to 1994. So that's, that's on the first bit of the record before there was the step change, the break change in the, in the data. And then we're finally in that correlation matrix, we're hoping to find a set of predictive variables where all the variables are significant in terms of their partial correlation. So there's no redundancy, there's no surplus variables in there because everything that you, you're retain, retaining is providing unique information. And then if that wasn't enough to keep you busy, the next thing is to just look at your, your short list of predictive variables and think about the physical basis. Do they make physical sense for, for what you do or don't know about the uh, driving mechanisms of rainfall at Novi Sad. Is that clear, Biliana? I think you're going to be in the driving seat and I suggest that those of you who have the, the software installed, please work through this exercise yourself and refer to the, the, the slides in the handout. Those that do not have it, please essentially join Juliana's group and discuss with her your, the choices and decisions you're making as you go through. I will sit here and just observe and chip in if I see that you're getting stuck or I think I can help, all right? Um, and let's give ourselves 20 minutes to do that. So we're going to um, finish this step of the exercise, which is it is the most time consuming bit and ideally we'd spend more than 20 minutes, but I just want to get you a, give you a sense of how this is done. 
let's just see how far you can get by a quarter past two your time or quarter past one UK time. All right, any, any questions? Let me stop sharing then and I will mute my... Uh, I would like just to ask everyone, should I, uh, should I share my screen while we are doing exercise or do everybody have the, the software installed and they will try on their, on their own? Just to send me, uh, if you don't want to um, use your microphone and speak, just send a short uh, um, note in the chat saying oh, we will do it on our own or please share the screen so I, I can so we so so, so to know what what we, what we should do please share the screen okay I will share the screen okay um, anyone who has it installed remotely and doesn't want to um, participate might just um, you know turn the sound off or something yeah, yeah. that's yeah. a good idea yes yeah. yes all right and I'll, I'll just stay here and um, see how the your screen goes and let's see how far <laughs> we can go in 20 minutes all right unconditionally unconditionally the occurrence of rainfall and conditionally amount Okay, now I will uh, start the program. Then, yes, okay. uh, settings. Uh, this is place where the the the, the yeah, I think you, you need to share your screen as well oh, sorry, once, you're, yeah, <laughs> yes. once you're up and running <laughs> yes um okay okay share uh, and here it is uh it starts from 1961 no, no, no. what's your problem I need to 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 uh, uh, okay. to import the data in in, in the. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so negative values. No, negative no. values, no. Uh, uh, event stressful, no. Random feeds. Okay. Yes. So, uh, yeah. Well, well done, whoever spotted allow, turning off the allow negative values. Yeah. That's a good start. We don't, we don't, want, we don't want negative rainfall, folks. Uh, new volume. So I, I'm looking at. Um, this is okay. Okay. And save, save. Save. Yeah, that's okay. good. And now we go to advanced. So uh, you, you don't need to worry about that right now. Okay. So you can just click on back. Go back. to click on. That's it. Okay. And uh, quality control. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then we select the select file. the file. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, remember, we're looking this for the old one. This is, I'm looking for the new one. Um, here it is. And the new one is here. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Open. And then and click on, click on check, check file. file. Yes. Okay, here, here are everything. Everything is reading well, so okay. that's good. Yeah. And also um, you'll notice that um, Actually, it looks like you've got the latest version here because it's showing the yeah, yes. text here. So you <laughs> so, somehow you've got hold of the latest version. Yes. <laughs> you see, you've sent us the latest version. <laughs> it's on the, the internet. Uh, it's, uh, so it's already leaked out there onto the no, internet. This one is 5.3. 5 5 yes. Oh, okay. All right. Not six, but 5.3. <laughs> okay. So, okay. So we go to transform data. 
No need to do that down, because down, down. Down. go to screen variables. Screen variables, that's it. Uh, yes, uh, here so, we yeah. select uh, again the file. Yeah, the but that, yes. the old that's file. It. And I need to. It's there, you can see it. Oops. Uh, yeah. Sorry, uh, this is the right. This is the right folder. Here it is. Okay. Yeah. And open, and it goes from nineteen sixty-one. Yeah. Uh, of nineteen ninety-four. Of nineteen ninety-four. Okay. That's it. Four. Yes. And uh, now you click on the box. Mm. That's it. And, and now you choose the variables. Now start to, to explore the predictive variables. Okay, I need to, to read <laughs> about which ones are actually. Which you like, yeah. So, like um, <laughs> uh, Na Natasha, if you like to jump in and make any suggestions here as to which predictive variables, you know, if. Are you able to? Did you? Did that all make sense to you? Observing remotely. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Okay, good. And okay, so we need to find the um, variables that are actually the ones the driving precipitation here in the Southeast Europe and in Novisat. So, uh, and uh, we need to find them here. But yeah, you, you're, you're sorry. looking. For you're looking for the needle in the haystack. Yeah. Right. So I have it here on, on, on the other computer at the list. And I will go through the list. And we should we should uh, select five or six different variables. Yeah, which you so, think are going to be sensible for your location. Yeah. On the same way to analyze. Wind direction, divergence. I think it's the divergence. The top is the glass that's the divergence near the surface. No, it pays to have the scar. Geostrophic divergence over at uh, 500 hectopascals. Five. So here we go. Just it doesn't doesn't matter if it doesn't, you know, you don't get the perfect model in the yeah, next 15, know, but... 15 minutes. Have a go. Uh, maybe press it to pre precipitate water. the water. Yeah. I'm just trying to find the. That's uh, where that'll be. They're, they're sorted alphabet. They're alphabetical in the list. So if you go go right down. Down, down, down. Uh -oh. There it is. That one. one. Yeah. This one. Maybe relative humidity. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, at, uh, at 500 pascals or hectopascals or near surface. In all sense, the pedestrian uh, statistics is not trained. Okay. I, that's, I'll just... that, that's lower down the list, the relative <laughs> humidity. Yeah, here it is. Okay. Um, Great. 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 So, I'm going to use the list of the statistics. is not trained. Okay. okay. Uh, I'll, I, I'll just um, uh, selected um, near surface relative humidity. Yep. Uh, and this is, those are the two. Let me just <laughs> find a little. If you, do, if you now click on the correlation button, it will, it will just explore those two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just click the correlation button and it's working. Now it's, now it's calculating. And here is the correlation, and it okay. is significant, as we can see. They're, they're both statistically significant, yeah. so you, you, you've made a good start there. <laughs> good, luck, good lucky guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now you just find me to find uh, one or two more. Yeah. And, uh, any hint or any suggestion, please? Everybody else just... Um, uh, 
Unmute your microphone. Are we are working as a group, please. Prof. Koyub. Koyub is a better. I don't know. Being direction. Being direction. Where it is. It's right on the start. MSLT. Yes, yes, yes. The potential temperature and that's what it means. Yes. I like you. I like you thinking. Yeah. Where? 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 P O T T M P. Oh, the potential temperature. Ah, okay, okay. Potential temperature, and I think that we are all set. We have three, four, maybe one more. What about? Uh, A precipitation. Uh, Just start it. Press. 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 You see, it all start. Press. 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 No. Uh, but should we use the precipitation? Yes, total, total. Even though, uh, 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 even though you said that um, uh, actually people are not really keen on using the total precipitation amounts. Yes, but you should be well, dry. I, I did look at precipitation ahead of time, <laughs> and I, I'll give you, I'll give you a hint. I'll say I, I wouldn't include it in this model because, yes, yes. because it has a lot of redundant information. Yeah. If I remember correctly, Anna. Uh, PowerPoint presentation, uh, there was a correlation between direct solar radiation and precipitation, and it was a... Uh, yes, that's right. So yeah. maybe we should use um, yeah, that, that would be an solar radiation Let's... as one, as, uh, as this one, the, the first yeah. one. So uh, let, me let me just ask everyone, uh, you know, if um, Bilyan is including um, direct solar shortwave radiation, why why might that physically make sense in a rainfall model? Any thoughts? Largest. Cloudiness, of course. Because of cloudiness, cloud. yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really good proxy for the amount of cloud cover, and we need clouds for rain, obviously. <laughs> so we should uh, then just uh, go to this uh, uh, correlation. Correlation, yep. yeah. Yeah. Uh, direct solar radiation, uh, mean sea level pressure, and we hold the heat. Uh -huh. uh, potential no. temperature, yeah. And we have everything that is actually statistically significant here. Everything statistically significant. Yeah. And if you look at your your list of variables, um, could could someone explain to me? Quickly, the thinking behind the four, the five variables you've got. Uh, should I or somebody else, maybe? Hmm? Okay, direct solar radiation, as Minuto said, because of the cloudiness, mean, yep. sea, level, mean sea level pressure. To be honest, Minuto actually. Yes. Well, uh, <laughs> usually, when uh, when there's an instability in, in the atmosphere, the pressure tends to be lower than. Uh, and when there is high pressure, then, then we have stable conditions in that. And, and, and that seems to fit your theory, Minuccio, because you've got a negative correlation, <laughs> high pressure, low rainfall, which is yes. what we're hoping for. Okay, yes. good. Great. And when it's high pressure, it's actually sunny. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, uh, potential temperature, uh, this is the unsaturated air parcel would have it lower the rate, so it is saturated with water vapor. Uh -huh. So this is also also the idea behind that one. Um, what is this precipitable water? The depth of a water column in the atmosphere. The water in that column were precipitated as rain. So the, yeah. it, it is obvious <laughs> why yeah. I select those. And relative humidity. The high relative humidity actually it it, it tends to be yeah. It could it, it 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 would lead to maybe higher precipitation due to the aerosols and everything in the atmosphere, maybe. Okay. Well, rel relative humidity, obviously, that's um, giving you a sense of what what the the proportion of the air is being made up of water vapor. So the larger it is, the more saturated the air. So it's relative humidity is a really good predictor variable for rainfall occurrence okay so it's uh, it tends to work less well compared with some of your others for rainfall amount okay so i think i think you've made a, a really good um 
start there. But make sure you note down your five predictive variables, because I think what would be interesting to do is to carry carry these through the, the rest of the process, yeah? Yes. I'll just see if someone here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does anyone else who um, is working remotely have how how have you been getting on with your choice of predictors is there anyone else working remotely we're talking about the p values if the p value is zero it means it's uh, um, the, the correlation is almost 100 uh, percent statistically significant e, um yes yeah, so we we have to be a little bit careful with how we so this p value when it's zero it means it's it's smaller than you know 0. 0.00001 yeah. so there's almost. there's always, there's always a chance that that this correlation could have occurred just by random means but when you see um you know, all zeros, the chances are that you've found a, a, a strong predictive variable, especially when we're looking at the partial correlation, because that's the unique piece of information from that variable to the overall behavior of rainfall after you've taken into account the fact that many of these variables are correlated with one another. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, all right. Um, I wonder if in the interest of time, we move to the next steps. Um, let me just look at my notes here. Yeah. Does anyone who's working remotely, would they like more time to look at the variables or for the sake of time, are you happy to go with uh, Bilyana's set of five as a test run? Should we do that? Okay, if I can have the, the screen back then. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can everyone see that? Yeah. Yes. All right. So I think, um, you know, that was um, impressive how quickly you cut to the chase there. Um, you, you could um, you know, rather, um, what's the word, uh, in, a, in a black box way, go through testing every single variable in the list um, and weighing up the pros and cons, um, just like a essentially a multiple regression model would do. But I think the danger there is that you lose the physical credibility of the model that you're building, whereas you you've built a model based on a good hunch of what should be uh, the controlling variables. Um, these were the ones that I came up with. Um, I'm not saying they're the right ones, and it would be very interesting to see how your set of five, how the results perform compared with, with mine. I'm not the local expert. This is me sitting thousands of kilometers away trying to second guess what's important. So. I, I went for the uh, surface lifted index as a measure of the stability of the atmosphere, which is important for very um, extreme rainfall amounts. Uh, mean sea level pressure for the same reasons as you. I included um, two other variables that you didn't have, which was the surface airflow, which is moving in a north-south or south-north direction. So that might be indicating whether how much continental air mass, whether it's dry or moist air, moving across the continent. And then I picked a variable that describes how much rotation there is in the atmosphere at, the, at high levels, because that can be an indicator of a disturbance. Like you, I went for the precipitable water and I went for uh, relative humidity. So there's a lot of overlap between uh, variable sets and, I, and I, I'm, I really want you to push your five through to see how yours compare. We went for the breakpoint here 
in 1995 because we saw the regime change and that's um, a good test of the model under non-stationary conditions. Um, traditionally, people might calibrate the model on the first half of the data and test it on the second half or use a cross-validation method where you fit on 90%, test on 10 and then do that 10 times until you've cross-validated across all the data. Um, what we've gone for here is a much, much tough, is a really tough test because we know there's a change in the data. So it's tougher than a split record approach, okay? Um, here you can see my correlation matrix where um, these six variables all have p-values of uh, zero, essentially. And they're, so they're all significant and they're all um, contributing useful information. But having said that, I've chosen six variables. So instead of your five, so I'm slightly, you know, slightly overfitting the model more than you are. So we'll see how that plays out. Uh, and these are the, uh, so that, that was for the unconditional model. So I was looking at the rainfall occurrence and with the same variables, they are all still significant for the conditional model. So I've got a set of six predictive variables that work well for predicting both the occurrence of rainfall and the amount of rainfall. So I was feeling quite happy at this stage, and given that they're all, all significant. Um, in the screen variables screen, there's a, another facility, um, the analyze button, which we didn't look at. And, and that allows you to see how the strength of the correlation varies by predictive variable here and through the year. So you can see, for example, that the strongest predictive variable in January was mean sea level pressure. But the strongest predictive variable in June is this upper atmosphere vorticity. And it just underlines the point I made in the first talk that the strength of predictive variables comes and goes in different levels throughout the year. So you're trying to capture the, the seasonal, seasonal variations in these predictors. Um, now, if you go to the advanced settings, so go to settings and then advanced settings. We're now getting ready to calibrate the model. And because we know rainfall amounts are not normally distributed, we want to apply a transformation to the rainfall amounts. And, by, and, and there's a number of choices, options here. But in my experience, the, the transformation that works best over most of the world, and believe me, I've tested this in all sorts of different countries all over the planet, and the fourth route transformation seems to be a really robust transformation. So that's essentially to, to convert the highly skewed rainfall amounts with the big outliers like the 121 millimeter and try to make it more normally distributed for the eventual model fitting. Okay. Now we go to the um, calibrate model. And um, I'm, I think I'm gonna hand, hand this back to you now, Juliana. I'm gonna let you, I'm going to talk you through the, the calibrate steps. If you, I'll stop sharing. And if you put your, uh, okay. your, your local screen up. Oh yes, okay. So we saved the, the advanced settings. So let, let me just, yeah, if you can go to settings, then uh, click on the settings button. That's yeah. it. And then and go to advanced, advanced settings. Yes, this fourth route. Yes. Yes. That's great. So you're, you're in good shape. Yeah. And then we just save it. Oh. Yeah, save and that. Go back. Back. Uh, yeah. And then again back. And then back. Yeah. Yeah. And. Now, now you're going to go along the, the, the 
linked again, and you're going to go to calibrate model. Click on calibrate model. Here, this one. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, it doesn't like it, does it? Remember we when we tested it, it doesn't like it when you change between screens. Something is going on. Let me just try again. Yeah. Okay, share. This is the calibrate model. That's it. Okay. Now, first thing then, if we just start, start in the top left-hand corner, you select the predict and again, which is yeah. the, the rainfall. All files. That's it. Open. Yeah. Now and select. Now, now we're going to give a, yeah, click on the output file part. That's give it. it. Give it a name that uh, makes sense to you. On the calibrate one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, um, right now, remember um, that the part, this par file that this this is going to generate is the one that that really helps me to help you if you get stuck. Yeah. If you're using SDSM, then you. Can you please uh, uh, can you please repeat the, the last sentence? This part file helps you to help me when we yeah. get stuck. Yeah. When you get stuck, because it, it provides lots of diagnostic information okay. that tells me how you set the model up. So if you ever get stuck with SDSM and you want my help and you send me an email, send me the PAR file and okay. nine times out of 10, I can fix the problem. Okay. Mm -hmm. Only only nine times out of ten. <laughs> you know we're gonna get hundred <laughs> percent. Okay. So now change the data period. Data period, remember we're fitting it on the first bit of the record, which is to ninety-four. Ninety-four. Okay, now you've got to select your predictor box. That's mm -hmm. it. Now select your the variables that you wanted before. Uh, let's see. Just this one. Uh, mean sea level. This one. That's it. Put out uh, this one. Yeah. This one. Uh, this and one. that. Okay, that's good. Now. You're going to build a conditional model. So if you go across the top to process, and then, uh, sorry, just beneath there, across <laughs> to the right. Sorry, this That's one. It. Yeah, <laughs> I'm pointing at my screen and you can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is conditional. I, I check the conditional. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Um, now, if I look at your screen, I th before you before you click on anything, you see right in the bottom this cross validation. Yeah. Yeah. No need to click that, but that's what I mentioned to you earlier. If you if you hadn't done the petite test and looked at a step change, you you click on that and it and it if with two folds it just splits one half for calibration and one half for validation. If you have five folds, which is what I'd recommend, it, it breaks it up into 20% chunks, fits and tests on each of those 20% chunks. And that's a that's a more, you know, it's a, a more a, a quicker way of doing it, um, but it's not as tough a test as the one that we're doing. Okay. Yeah. Right. So now you're ready to click on calibrate. Calibrate, yes. There we go. So that, that that's that's the results file, which shows you the um, the amount of explained variant on each month for firstly the occurrence of rainfall in the top set of results, and then for the amount of rainfall. So you can see that your model. You can see that your model explains 23% of the variance in occurrence, but but only about 10% in the um, amount at the bottom. Can you see that? In the bottom? Uh, this yeah, mean? That, yeah, the mean. Okay. Yes, yeah, the three models. Uh, I'm not really sure about what I'm looking at. Uh, R squared is actually uh, this mean. 
Yes. It actually says it explains 22.8%. Yeah, so I, I like to work in round numbers. Yeah, so I say 23. Let's round, be kind okay. to ourselves. 23%. And uh, around 10% of uh, amount. Yeah, on this the amount. The last, sorry, this yeah. is the last one. So That's it, okay. yeah. Okay, now I understand. Yes. Yeah, but you can, you can see, for example, if you look at the amount that it, predicts the amount better in January than it does in July yeah. or, or in October. Yeah. October, it's very poor. Very. Uh, Rob, can we just have a, a, just a second? Because um, uh, uh, just to share which variables I use just to have the same results here in the room. Is it okay just to yes, say Sure, yeah. For the yeah. Kako se da ovom sliku da vam pošljem? Evo vam na... Gledamo, gledamo, gledamo. Evo vam na... na... Gledamo, gledamo. Sad, e, vidim, okačio sam, mislim, nisam znao koje si takve parametre, sad sam ih našao, sam ih... Okay. Evo vam pošljem na ovoj kočici. Evo. Još jedan, dva, tri, četiri, pet. Pet komada. Šest. Tri posljednje sam okačio. Evo se. Ali vidite. Vidimo, vidimo. Ali sad vidite. Čas je na... Uh, na Viber sam. Na Viber, gledam nešto si postala, da sad ću vidjeti. Ja sam ovaj... Uh, našao sam, pa sam okuca tri, posljednje sam odabrao. Sad nisam bio sino klasati prva dva, Aha, ali sam sad otkačen. Aha, ti, 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 ti nisi classification. Nisam. Znači, pred... Ja, to rekao, ja, ti nisi ni prvi. Ja, ja, ja bih vam predložio. Ja bih da sam savjetovao. Posljedno kad su negativni. Da. Uh, okay, we, we can we can continue. Can we continue? Yes, 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 yes we can continue. Okay, this is, we're, in, we're in good shape, okay? All right, so if you, if you click on the back button, um, so you've, you've built your model now, now we are ready to go to the next step, which is the weather generation. This one. Yes, that's it. Unconditionally converted generator. Oh, sorry. No, that's <laughs> because... Again, now I will go back. Yeah, we need we need Zoom to be able to work with SDSM, don't yeah. we? Yeah. <laughs> now it's bad. I think whenever I click uh, the, yeah, some it, kind it, of button here in the... It can't uh, handle that, uh, yeah. <clears throat> I think we found that before. Okay, yeah. so now if you go to uh, select parameter file... <clears throat> This is pad. No, uh, no. The, the one uh, that you just created, the okay. part file. Uh, uh, no, I, I think you had it just before the. the it, 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 sorry, I know what, what, what's the problem. Here is it. It actually put it here. Oh uh, yeah, I can see it. It's just down um, here. Yeah. Yeah. There, it, okay. that's it. Okay, that's <laughs> good. Now, if you if you work down and you click on the box you, under, that's it. Just and now, if you click on View Details under Data, you oh, can so, see yeah. that's so, confirmed yeah. that you've got the right variables. Yeah. Um, what we're going to do is now change we're going to use your model to simulate the full period all the way through from 1961 to 2017 so you want the maximum record length which is 25568 255568 yep and now you select a go to an output file and no 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 top right hand here that's it and it will go to the, the different folder. It, it actually moves me from the folder from the previous workshop to, to till today's workshop. So okay. So, I'll, I'll, so give it give it a name that makes sense to you. Oh, ah, which out out twenty two twenty two. Okay. Excuse me. When we generate generate the file, will it um, 
uh, make the, the data from 1948 or from 1961. It's going to go from... Um, uh, in your case, it's going to make it go from 19... Uh, 61. So okay. that's well spotted. This Change is... that to 1948, please. So, okay. Uh, that's not... So if we, if, we, if we left it like 61, it would go into future? Uh, no, it wouldn't. It would just... Uh, <laughs> oh, no. It, you'd probably get an error because it would run out of okay. data. Yeah. Okay, so we put the, the, the 48 and go to yeah. yeah. so, okay. uh, Whoever spotted that gets a bonus point ahead of the quiz. <laughs> now I think now you're ready to click on the synthesize button. Hopefully it will all work. So now it's, it's modeling uh, about 70 years of data 20 times because you've got an ensemble size of 20. So it's, it's produced 1,400 years of daily data. Um, and that's it, done in 10 seconds. Okay. All right. Yes, we did it. Okay, I think if, you, if you'd if you like to um, give me the return of the screen, I'll, I'll just... Okay, wait a few. I'll stop sharing. Okay. Oh, this is extreme zooming, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Everything is about extreme today. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Okay, can everyone see my slides? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so we've, we've calibrated the model. Whoops, let me just... Oh. Uh, those were the results I, I got. So uh, about 28% explained variance in the uh, currents and about 17 in the, in the amounts. Just like you've done now, we've set up the weather generator with the right pathway, the checked the variables, checked the 1948 full record. To, so we're going to have a bit of hindcasting as well as forward looking bit outside of the data used for calibration. And then we ran the, the model. This was the exercise I was going to set you, but you've done most of this already, so we can save a little bit of time, and I can show you what the results look like. If you can, if you if you look at the output file that's been created, it's just a big Excel, uh, sorry, an, a, a an ASCII file with twenty columns, where each column represents one ensemble <laughs> member. And what I've done here is I've just picked out for the, the year 2000, which was the driest year in, in the Novi Sad record. And I've pulled out the first ensemble member. Um, and you can see the black is the observed rainfall amount and occurrence. And the blue is the um, model simulation. Now, you because, and I really want to stress this, because SDSM has a, a strong random component to it, that's how it generates the ensembles, you don't expect the time series to match perfectly. That we're, we're trying to replicate the overall statistical properties of the time series and its distribution and its seasonality. That's what we're trying to do. So this, this shows that the, the model is producing by and large, realistic clustering. It's showing where you've got the wet spells here. You've got wet spells here and it's picking up the wet spells and it's, it's, it's not simulating rainfall in the dry spells. So it's working well in terms of the, the occurrence. Um, and if we look at the wettest year, mm -hmm. similar thing, you know, you don't expect the, the peaks to necessarily perfectly match. But you, you hope that the clustering of wet and dry spells do match, which they, they do. And remember that we calibrated the model on data up ending in 1994. So here we're testing the model's ability to simulate rainfall for a period outside of the calibration uh, data set. So that again, this is a really, really tough test of a statistical downscaling model. Um, <laughs> I'm going to hand back controls to you now.
and then we'll do um, one one or two more things and then take a break because I think we could probably do with a breather. <laughs> if you'd like to to load up the um, the downscaling model again. Okay, I'll just. That's right. Here it is. Okay, so we've generated the the output. Now's the time to sort of start to look at. Um, you know what? What do the data actually look like? Um, so if you go to um, summary statistics, sorry again. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Summary statistics. I, I clicked it and it zoomed okay. me out. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So now, if you um, select, go to the your select file. Uh, this is the original one. Uh, you you want your output because we're, we're looking at the model data first. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. You might need to click on the all files to find it. it. Yeah. Oh, um, this one is out. Uh, was it that? Uh, the, 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 the one that we simulated, that we created that in the last step. Okay. It's already That's turned it into Excel. Excel. That's strange. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> We'll see I if that works. Already. Yeah. Uh, and then select the output. Save so, the, so this Ooh. is the file. You you've got to give another name for um, yeah. this, this is where you're going to put the results of the statistical analysis. Okay. Output your input uh, this one should be no it's our statistics. Yeah, that's that'd be good. A uh, good yeah. Statistical uh, sales. Oh okay. That's good. Okay. Um now we're going to just um analyze to start with the, the period that we use for calibration. So let's just um set the date range 61 to, to 94. 61. Oh, oh. Okay. Now, if, if you click on view details, hopefully, yeah, so that confirms that you've got yeah. the right file. You've got five predictive variables that the run began in 48 and it had 25,000 days in it. Okay. Yeah. Next, next thing we need to do. Let them Next thing we need to do is to go to the actual um, statistics button. It's probably going to yeah. crash us out now. <laughs> Let's no, try that. No. Oh, no, it works for some reason. Yes. Oh. Okay. So now we're going to pick some variables that make sense for, for rainfall. So I suggest we keep the mean. Okay. We keep, we keep the maximum. We don't need the minimum yeah, because we know the minimum is zero. We'll keep the sum because that will give us the monthly total. We'll keep the variance. Let's go for peaks over threshold and make it 25 because 25 millimeters in one day would be considered quite heavy rainfall. Mm -hmm. um, let's go for the maximum five day total. Okay. Let's go for the percentage wet. And mean let's go mean, mean dry, uh, wet spell length, let's say. Okay. Wet spell length. Good. So then we go back. Dobra. And now if we click on analyze. Analyze? Analyze. Analyze. Okay, here it is. There you go. You can see. <laughs> okay. You can see this. This is just giving you. You know, you're not expected to to read that and interpret it. It just these results would be written to the output file that you just created. And in the next step, we're going to just look at the results um, visually. So uh, I go back. So if you click back. Back. Open. And then. Now, uh, we're going to do the same, but with the observed data. So okay. click on that, um, select 
now you're going to yeah click on the select file now you've got to find the actual observed data that's that's the one. Yeah, that's good. Now save statistics to some other file. Out. Hang on, what's happening here? On the save statistics too. So I I saved them. No, this is the wrong file. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Yeah, you see, what we what what we what you're learning through this process is that yes. it's it's helpful if you keep everything in the one folder. Oh, yes. Yeah, and it just makes <laughs> life nice. simple. Yes, yeah. but, but it the, keeps the, me keeps the, me running from one to another folder. Uh, yeah, it's it's, so it's the good. first step. You you testing your right hand coordination, but oh, it's oh, easier if it's in one folder. <laughs> Yes. Okay. This is the the the, the, the observed. So should we change, change the analyze? No, no, no. Keep the keep the same period because okay. you're comparing the observed data with the model data during the calibration period. Okay. So now, if you click on analyze, it will produce okay. statistics for the observed data. Okay. Analyze. analyze. There you go. So that's so now we've got two sets of results. One, one set of statistics from the model, another set of results from the uh, uh, observations. And then the final step before we take the break is to visually compare these. Try the edge book. And so should I open the, the other? If you go click on back. Okay. And then, shall we just should we just give everyone else a second to you know, catch us up? Yes. tell of your details, but we we had an error uh, when we tried to view details. Then uh, it uh, has an error. You must select an appropriate scenario file and. Uh, uh, because because we are not using the, the observed, not this model yes. scenario. Yes. That's why you don't ah. click the view details. Yes. Yes. Ah, yes. So, because you don't have. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well spotted. Yeah. It should actually. That's a. We, we should actually get the software when you click on observe. Oh. For that to, to blank that out or to rep, to put put information <laughs> tell you it's observed. Okay, so so we found a bug. Yeah. You found a bug. Yeah, I owe you a beer because that's the going rate <laughs> for every <laughs> bug. <laughs> okay, now let's go to compare results, please. <clears throat> And just go back in. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Select file. So select the observed the, the result, the one the one with your observed in. I'd suggest that you put first. You've got you had it. Okay. Yeah, well, that's from the last workshop. Oh, okay. All right. That's from the last. I now I'm not this is the observed. Uh, no, 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 you won't with the, the statistics. Uh -huh. statistics. Okay, yeah. observe. That's it. Yeah, that's Probably. good. And the other one is modeled. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, look, it, it, just, it, it keeps me, uh, it actually drives me to that uh, early stage researchers workshop folder. That's maybe because that's what was set up in the um, over in the major settings. Yeah, that's my problem. <laughs> okay, now now if you click on the the, the mean and the mean in in here, and then you click on line chart. Just a second. Compare results. Compare results. Compare results. Okay. 
Da, da. A i samo min to treba da obeležimo. Da, obeležimo koje je od observed okay. statistika Dobro. i od modela. So, we actually are going to compare the mean in the observed uh, statistics and uh, in the observed values in and in the modeled values. That's right. And if you click on the line chart, it, will, it should compare the two. This there is... you go. And I'm a little bit bigger now. Now, you, um, you, you can customize these charts, you can change the colors, the settings, the, the labels, everything. Well, it's good to it's too much of time. Yeah, so don't worry about that. Let's go back and look at the other, how the other um, uh, statistics compare. It's not all close. Uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Maximum and line. Oh, not so good. <laughs> no. oh, okay. uh -huh. But when you think that that's just one one value that you're comparing um, in each month, so it's a pretty tough test. Uh, let's see the lines. Line. Oh, that's not too bad. Too bad. <laughs> not too bad. Okay. But you think, you know, you only spent, what, 10 minutes deciding yeah. on your predictor variables. So don't be too harsh on yourself. <laughs> okay. uh, which one should be um, uh, percentage of the web base, maybe? Yeah, I'm, I'm confident that will be good. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, true. There you go. So the, 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 this STSM is very good at simulating the occurrence of rainfall. That's yeah, it, correct. does that very well. Okay. Uh, you, you just try the um, try the peaks over thresholds. So that's the number of days with 25 millimeters. I could mean, uh, you could mean a pretty that's really bad. Okay, so you no, I don't. Don't. On, on that good feel on that feel good note, shall we take a take a break for a cup of tea now or something? Yeah, yeah. yeah if everyone agrees, yeah. It's, oh, it's, yeah. All right, so 15 minutes and we'll come back <laughs> and continue with this. Okay. Oh, okay, see you in oh, 15 yeah. minutes. Thank you. Okay. Okay, shall we continue? Uh, yes, we can. <laughs> so I'm conscious that we only have um, an hour left. So what I propose we're going to do is we're going to move through the remaining steps with the precipitation um, modeling and downscaling and the evaluation. Um, there, there was a further talk for this afternoon but that though you have those slides and all the connecting um, sources in the um, online folder. And I think, you know, given the time it, it, that you can just browse through that and follow up on any links that are of interest. And the two case studies that are provided in that presentation demonstrate how the tool is used in an adaptation context. Now, um, one uh, another option might be that I give that talk as as one of the you know filler lectures that we have in the program, Liliana. So okay. people might come back for that some other time. Um, yeah, that's, that is also a nice idea. Yes. Yeah, um, but then I'd I'd also like I'd like to save about twenty minutes at the end in our in our hour to to do the quiz. Just so we we finish on some um, some overarching ideas, you know, it just confirms that we've understood everything, uh, uh, the key points, and then I'll sum up with just uh, one or two key points. Okay, so I think that's probably the best way we can use the remaining time. All right. Yeah. Um, so if you go, if you if you bring back SDSM. Okay. You're, you're in charge again. Again, okay, here it is. Okay, so I think at your leisure, you would be able to compare all sorts of different um, diagnostics, but we today are concentrating especially on extreme rainfall. So what I'd like to do now is to just 
We'll just have a look at the um, frequent frequency analysis. That's it. Okay. Here it is. Okay. So, um, and, and this is there's more information on here than than in the the, the previous version, but it still does exactly the same. Um, let's select the observed data. So this is the actual original uh, raw data file. Yes. And I'm looking for it here. Right. Oh, okay. uh, this is the, the original. That, that's the original file. That's good. And now your, your modeled data. Uh, I'll go back. Uh, 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 uh. Okay, this one, and this is out. Yeah, this is modeled. That's the modeled one. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, <clears throat> it, what, what we're going to try and do here is compare the annual maxima in the observed with the the distribution of the annual maxima in the, the model. <clears throat> So it's important that we we give the model a fair um, a fair comparison. So let's change the date range to 1961 to 94. So we're going to look at the calibration data first. Okay. Um, now, if if you click on uh, yeah empirical, that's good. Now, if you click, go right to the and above. Oh yeah, no, no, no. Um, where you see the, the 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 line with the reset button, you've got a whole load of other buttons. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Now, if you click on um, F A graphical, this one, uh, yes. that one. Yeah, uh -huh. let's just see what happens. <laughs> Uh -huh. Now this takes a while to to because yeah, it's, it's processing working. a lot of data and it's looking for the maxima. These statistics that are output are for the GEV distribution. If you were doing any other modeling, so I just click uh, OK. Click uh -huh. OK. Yeah. Okay, and that's the error in the model mean mean absolute error okay so what you've got here is a comparison of of your model which is in the red line yeah. with the confidence intervals compared with the um, um observed generalized extreme value distribution so you can see that up to um the five-year return period your model's quite reasonable but beyond that the model is underestimating yeah. the extreme value distribution but that's from the generalized extreme value distribution let's go back and look at the gumball distribution and then click on f graphical again that's it Okay. It's still underestimating. It's, it's still underestimating. Okay. So if you so if you want if if the purpose of your study is the extreme values, then you would probably want to go back to the beginning and and, and look at a different set of predictive variables to see if you can improve your model okay if you are interested in the seasonal pattern of wet day occurrence then your model seems to be fine so it depends what you're you're seeking to apply the model to all right um i just want to show you um one other thing as well uh, well a couple of other things if you go to go back now and 
so so you can see on this this screen there's lots of different buttons to do with um frequency analysis um you can also if you click on fa tabula that gives you you might want to know the actual numbers let's just do that Okay. Okay. So now you have the actual return period with the observed uh, uh, statistics according to Gumbel. So it's saying that um, based on the available data in the 1961 to 94 period, it thinks the 100 year rainfall total should be 90 millimeters. OK, mm -hmm. now remember <clears throat> that period doesn't include the 121 millimeter event, which uh, was in 2015. But we also note that, that we think there's been some change in the um, in the climate regime in the in the latter period. So. Um, so that's why, you know, you might inter you might on the one hand think, well, the 100 year value is a bit low, given that we know it was broken um, a few years later, but we can still interpret this um, in, in a ver various ways. And you can see that the, uh, the, the model is kind of, a, it, it is okay for the two year return period event, all right? It's, 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 it's about 10% under for the three year event. So it's, it's producing reasonable estimates for, let's say nuisance rainfall. So a heavy rainfall that might occur once every two years, the model as it is with the predictive variables does a, um, a decent job. Now, if, I, if you give me, turn the screen to me, I'll just give you a quick glance through. Uh, let's try that, where was I? Yes. Okay. Can you can you see it now? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so skip all the way through here. Um, and so we we're doing the. Sorry. We we we're using this screen. This is from the older version of SDSM. But it does the same yes. thing. Also, tight there, so that the mnemonic contrast. Super. To enable. Now you can see that um, uh, here. I've looked at different different periods of record, sixty-one to ninety-four, which was our calibration period, and my predictive variables. Um, for the Gumbel model, give an almost um, perfect uh, simulation, but then I had longer than ten minutes to think about the model and calibrate it. Okay, so um, um, I looked at that and I thought, okay, I'm quite happy with that. But then when I test the model in the independent period, which you could you could do in your own time by just changing the dates um, that we use for the frequency analysis, you can see that the the model um, underestimates the extreme value distribution. This, the ensemble mean is too low compared with the observed value, but the ensemble upper bound estimate is roughly correct. So I could actually use this upper bound estimate from the model and say that that brackets the observations. But once again, I'm, you know, it's, it, it's saying that there's something has happened at this in this weather record in the last 20 years that has changed the nature of the rainfall extremes. And I think we would need to do further investigation to see whether that's a real effect or some artifact of say, perhaps a change of instrumentation, change of something at the site. Is this a real, real result or not? So I think it, 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 it raises some interesting um, questions. Now then, um, what shall we do? If we do, yeah, so here, if I look at the entire 
data period using all of the information available and I fit the statistical model to the whole data set to just try and emulate the observed data now I get a, um, a better estimate of the um, extreme value distribution for the period as a whole but we know that there's some non-stationarity in the record so I would you know the, the statistics you know, Manfred wouldn't like this, <laughs> I think, uh, because we're, we're, we know that the data are non-stationary, but we're treating them as if they are stationary by pooling them all into one model. So um, I just show that, but with a very, really big cautionary remark. That, that's what you would do if you hadn't done all of the preliminary analysis, the preliminary investigation of the data that we did this morning. You might have assumed the data are all stationary and you fit the model to the whole data set and you get a good result like that. OK. I think it'd be interesting to run this past Manfred and see what he thinks we should do about it. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to just show you the, 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 the time series um, step where Actually, Lo, well, let's. Let, I'm going to hand that back to you. You can. You, you, I'm going to make you work at this then. So, okay. I'm going to, all right. So, if you do the time series, okay. uh, back and time series. Yeah. So that's right at the, the very end of the process. So we're we're getting close to the end of our twenty steps. Um, Okay. All right. Now, um, you can see on the right hand side, there's a whole range of pre prepared things that you can compare that are suitable for rainfall, temperature, and all sorts of other variables. Yeah, you might need to re reload that, click on the file again. That's it. Yeah, I'm just trying to find the right one. That's it. Okay. Uh, here it is. Okay. Okay. Now you, you you don't probably you, you've probably well unless you've got it in different locations. Oh yeah, I think you have, haven't you? You've got your observed <laughs> data. Yeah. So you see the model's perfectly set up for people who want to keep their data in lots of different files. <laughs> okay, so let's pick the observed record first. That's it, and then pick the um, output. That's it, and now let's just. Um, click on the, go right to the top where you can see raw data, time period. Yes. Yeah, select annual from the drop down. All right, and now if you just click on plot, hopefully that will plot the annual time series. Right, it appears to contain multiple columns. Assembly. That's multiple. okay, you can, okay. you can click on that. That's just warning you that it's just taking the first ensemble member from the yeah. 20 to look at. So without the remaining, it will not be plotted. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's because you've got no observed data for 1948. Yeah. Okay, so you can see in the green, the green line is the model <laughs> output. Yeah. And the model thinks that there should be a drying trend based on the changes in the atmosphere. The observed data thinks there should be a rising trend and increased vari variation. Um, so this is why I think this is a really interesting site to try and understand whether this is the, the, because the model is no good or because there's something has changed at the at the site. I honestly don't know which which is the result. But you can see also you've got uh, data. Uh, for, for before 1961, so SDSM has, has reconstructed what it thinks the annual rainfall total should have been during that period. Yeah. Now, if we go back, we can, it, rather than annual, let's just take a look at one of the seasons. Let's look at winter. Okay, and then plot again. Yeah. Okay.
I'm sorry if you can hear noise outside. It's the leaf blower guy who's come back. He's always here when I'm doing a presentation. We cannot hear it. <laughs> okay. All right. Now look at this. It looks like there's there's the model is doing a good, you know, the model and the observations seem to be matching much better in mm -hmm. winter. So I I you know it's helping us to figure out what's what's going on between the model and the observation. So um, that, that, that gladdens the heart. That makes me feel happy when I see a plot like that compared with the previous one. It says that there is some skill there in, sim, in downscaling the winter rainfall at Novi Sad, and we would spend more time to try and investigate where the problem is. What, is there a problem month, a problem season, problem period that is causing the model to depart from the observations and always keeping in the back of our mind is this a result of the uh of the model a poor model or is it the result of poor or suspect data okay but this gives me hope that there is skill in this model because that's that's pretty good for a an annual total series over such a long period and also keeping, keeping in mind that we only calibrated the model on a short segment of the data, all right? So it's a, the, the last 25 years of the data set are completely independent of the model because mm -hmm. we, we didn't put those data into the model when we trained it. So um, I think that's, a, that's a, actually a very encouraging result and says that we're on the right track, okay? All right, um, if you like to hand the control back to me, I'll just show a few more slides um, for this. Okay, okay so um, we've done the time series analysis and you can compare models built on different periods and all and different seasons and try and find out where the skill is and what's going wrong. Um, these exercises are all in your slides. So um, in your own time, if you're interested, you can go through the slide deck and just follow the instructions and repeat what we've done this afternoon. Um, and I'm saying, whoops, I'm jumping ahead here. So when we get the differences, I think there's, if we could just lay our hands on the raw data, like the raw data sheets like this, to, to try and see what's happening. I mean, this isn't for, for Novisad, this is for a site in Ireland, but the actual original data, um, might give us an insight into to what's going on at this particular station because it's a very intriguing result. I've not seen one like this um, for, for, for many years and I, I think it's worth further inquiry. But then the final um, steps are to create um, <laughs> projected <laughs> changes. <laughs> Uh, sorry, the, the internet actually stopped on my computer, so I'll just... Okay, all right, okay. So um, you'll, you'll see the scenario generator screen, which is where you um, cr create scenarios to emulate future conditions using this model. Okay, so in this little example, given the time that we've got left, I'm just showing to you um, one of, the, one of the, the, the treatments that I might do. So I'm saying that it's a conditional process because we're, we're recognizing there's rainfall occurrence and amount. I'm setting the event threshold at zero as before for wet and dry days. And I'm simply adjusting the, um, the mean value in the model, the mean values by 20%, okay? And seeing what happens. So you think, you might think, well, if I change it by 20%, um, it's just every, everything's going to be lifted up by 20%. It, it'll be, uh, you know, what, what, 
what do we actually learn from that? And, and anyway, Rob, why pick 20%? So that 20% comes from looking at the uh, other sources of information, which tell us what, what might be the projected changes in, in rainfall across this uh, region of Europe. And here I've just taken for illustrative purposes, um, rapid plots produced by the KNMI Climate Change Atlas. Again, you can get to that by just clicking on the link and you, and you can, for countries or domains very quickly um, extract uh, uh, data on all sorts of um, projected climate change conditions. And here I've just, taken the information from the EU Cordex data for the, the region. And you can see that um, I'm, I've gone for RCP 8.5 at the top, re representative concentration pathway 8.5. I've gone for the period 2041 to 2070, so the 2050s, and I've compared that with our baseline 1961 to 2017 just to make it tailored to, to what we've been looking at. And I've also extracted the 95th percentile for RCP 4.5, so an, an optimistic view of the future. By and large, you look at these in the, in the, in the region of Serbia, and um, where you're not seeing stippling, there's a statistically significant change outside of variability. Uh, here we can see for, for winter, and here we can see for summer, and here we can see for the year as a whole. So in winter time, there's evidence that a 20% uplift, a 20% increase in the um, rainfall amount is a credible change by mid-century. So I can could just literally use that sort of um, supplementary information to inform the next step, which was, as I said, to, to, to lift that up by 20%. And um, when, you, when you put that into the, um, into the model and then generate new scenarios and compare them with the baseline scenario that we just produced earlier today, here I'm pulling out again the the number of events over 25 millimeters. And that's the interesting thing, a shift in the mean can have a disproportionate impact on certain parts of the rainfall distribution. So you can see a 20% increase in the mean lifts up the number of those heavy rain days, the 25 millimeter events quite significantly, quite a lot. There's a lot more now than we had before. Um, and you can, reproduce the frequency analysis to see how uh, a certain statistic might change. So if we're looking at the return period event under the gumball for the baseline, and then with the change scenario, you've got the new statistics that can uh, drop out. And then finally, uh, with the latest version of SGSM, you can get sub-daily data. So you might be able to see how a 20% change would affect the statistical properties of the, the daily, the six hourly, three hourly, two hourly, and one hourly rainfall intensities over different return periods shown by the different colored bars here. Blue for a two year return period through to yellow with um, a 20 year return period. And just that simple change can be used um, to produce all sorts of novel types of extreme value distribution that you can use to test the design of things like um, urban runoff and drainage systems. And in the final talk, the second case study is where SDSM was used to do this, I think in Norway, to test how um, green garden spaces, garden areas in cities can be used to soak up heavy rainfall and reduce 
pluvial flooding under changed climate conditions. So I really encourage you to look at those slides and see the case, the, the case study from Norway, which is a really nice, nothing to do with me, a completely independent study that used SDSM to analyze these kinds of changes um, in, in, a, in an applied context. Okay. Um, that was a very um, rush through the 20 steps. But you, you do have the slides, you have the primer sheet, and I hope through this uh, session this afternoon, you've got a sense of you know, how you navigate through the SDSM tool. Once you get that, the idea of how um, you just select files to feed in and you, you change things in, in the model, it's quite robust. It's hard to make this um, software crash. Um, but you do need some care in terms of how you set things up and you knew, do need to give some care and time to the calibration step. But nonetheless, I hope that you're encouraged from what you've seen today with um, the local team, their 10 minute effort, looking at the five predictor variables, created a model that produced a reasonable estimate of the, of the winter rainfall um, totals a slightly lower than the hoped for estimates of the extremes, but there's still, I think, optimism that your model could be improved. Are there any, any, any questions from that lot uh, before we just have the final half an hour and a sort of a, a, a quiz for you, which will sort of test how much you've picked up from today? Any questions? Natasha, you, you were in, the, in a sense uh, the, the fly on the wall observing this from afar. Did it, having seen the process through, do you, do you feel confident that if you can install this, that you've got enough um, understanding now, or is there anything that you, you need clarity on? Um, I think following it was really, was actually really helpful. Um, I have a quick question. So, from the first step overall, did you just download daily precipitation for the site. Yeah, so um, Biliana gave us uh, data for the site at Navy SAD, um, which, we, which were the data that were in the Excel file. Remember right at the start of the day, mm -hmm. we were looking at the data to see whether we, you know, there was anything unusual in there. That was the, the raw data that I was given. And then the next step was to, remember, um, get it into that 1948 onwards um, series to, so it matches the start date of the SDSM predictors. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. And then you choose the different variables to calibrate the model. Is that right? That's exactly right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the that's the part of the process that should take you the longest. We only spent 10 minutes on that today, mm. but um, uh, you know, I'm trying to think how long I, I probably spent half an hour looking, looking through the predictors to arrive at my set. Um, but that even that's quite, quite quick. Okay. But the, the, cru the crucial thing is that we want, we want to select predictor variables that, have explanatory power, but also make sense to us based on our local knowledge. Or, you know, if you're, if you're working on a site that you've never visited before or a country you've never visited for, before, it's sometimes helpful to get, to just do some background reading on what are the, the local climate phenomena and, you know, what's the seasonality? Is it a monsoon climate? Is the winter maximum, you know, is the rainfall a, a maximum in the winter or the summer? Just do, it's worth spending a, a short while getting some background information on the site, the location that you're studying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And then just one quick question for the future scenarios. So there isn't just a simple step of um, putting in RCP 8.5, 4.5 and 2.6. You have to, we have to find our own, like, I guess you had like, was it thresholds, the 20%? Yeah, so this is, this is what, the, the thing that makes people feel nervous about yeah. this 
version of SCSM because it doesn't directly take um, global climate model information. It's not intended to, to downscale in the traditional sense. It's mm -hmm. intended to allow you to generate uh, much more flexibly different scenarios of the future that may be informed by but not driven by a global okay. climate model. And that's why I really encourage you. It's a shame we don't have the time because the, the example from Norway um, is a really nice one because it shows how by making these what might seem quite arbitrary adjustments or treatments, mm -hmm. um, how, you, how you can create these time series that then can be used to test how a, a, a modeled system like a, a water supply or a runoff system performs in the future. Okay. okay. Makes sense. <laughs> but it, 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 I'm glad you asked that question because the um, the lack of direct input for, of climate mm -hmm. model information makes some people nervous about using this version of the downscaling tool because it's it's mm -hmm. it's not consistent. It's not the same as the traditional way of doing downscaling. It, but it's not intended to be used in the same way. It's intended to be used to stress test and analyze breaking points in water supply or drainage systems or, or agricultural systems rather than to predict the future. Okay, that makes sense. That's quite helpful. All right. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Well, um, I think you're all ready for the quiz. It wouldn't be um, it wouldn't be a Rob workshop session without a quiz at the end of the day. So uh, let me just load that up for you and see how you get on. Okay, is that good? Can everyone see the, the, the downscaling quiz slide? No, no, we cannot. Not yet. We just see your PowerPoint. Yes, uh, the slide 17 or no. Scenario generator. Scenario generator. Oh, perhaps you need to, um... oh, that's strange. <laughs> okay, let me just, Stop sharing then. <clears throat> yeah, and now. Now nothing. Now try to share the the, the quiz. Just quiz. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think here it is. <laughs> all right. Yeah, we can't end the day without a quiz. <laughs> Only tripping questions. Whoops! Power cut as well. Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> so uh, let's see how you get on. First question. What is the first step in a downscaling analysis? Is it input data quality assurance checks, predictor variable selection, having clearly defined goals, access to downscaling software and models? So Discuss amongst yourselves or think in your own head for 30 seconds what you would like to go for. <laughs> Anyone like to volunteer an answer? Well, you could put, let's put the chat up then. Uh, it, type it into the chat what you think the answer should be. Whoops. Let's close that. Okay. Everyone uh, going for C, anyone think it's not C? All right, let's see what the answer is. C. Having clearly defined goals. So I hope, you know, it was an early start to the day, certainly for me, but um, 
knowing what you're trying to achieve from the, the downscaling study will, will help you decide whether you need a statistical downscaling model, <clears throat> a regional climate model, and if once you made those decisions, which particular type of model um, from the, and whether or not you even need a model, maybe some interpolation technique or bias correction of global climate models is good enough. But honestly, just having a clearly defined set of goals, what you're trying to achieve could cut out a lot of unnecessary work later on. And, you know, much as I love downscaling, I often say there's plenty of times when you don't need to do downscaling. Much simpler methods will, will suffice, all right? But then I think, okay, also today we've seen how much insight we can gain from a quite quick investigation of the quality of the data. Are there breakpoints? Are there any, any unusual values? Um, can we remember uh, uh, the extreme event occurring in, in, you know, from our own experience? And then of course, um, we've, we've seen how, how the predictor variable selection is obviously very important because that defines the, the results from the uh, model, but that, that comes, comes quite late in the process. And also access to downscaling software and tools, um, you know that that is often that can be important because um, there are parts of the world where people don't have the computing resources um, to to run more sophisticated model or the very complex data sets, and so having a, a suitable model is also important in those circumstances. But above all, know what you're trying to achieve, and then ask yourself: Do I really need to invest time in using a, a downscaling technique, or can I? Can I get the answers I need in a simpler way? All right, so did everyone get that right? I think you did. Question two, statistical downscaling is useful for infilling and reconstructing missing weather data, simulating the strength of an urban heat island, evaluating adaptation options by stress testing, all of the above. What do you think? <laughs> Mislim da je ovo pitanje bilo i na ono za prošlo, mislim da je bilo A, da može da se iskoristi za popunjavanje roda. Da, to je jeste ti rekla. Da, da, da. Ali može i za stimulating urban heat island da se radili. A može i za evaluiti kada je adaptation. Da, sve može. Okay, Natasha's gone for D. Anyone else disagree? Oh, look at that. Everyone's following Natasha. That sounds so... All of the above. Uh, it is a shame we didn't, it, it honestly is a shame we didn't have time to work through the, the case study from, from Norway because that would, re would, re would really show to you the way in which this tool can be used to test options. And in that deck of slides, there's also a case study from Denver Water where we use the model to investigate an adaptation option to improve water supply to Denver. And there's also an example from Ireland where this tool was used for the first time to look at um, the flood allowances used by Ireland. You know, is a 20% allowance for flood, future floods big enough was essentially the question we asked using the tool. So look at those slides and, and um, just get in touch with me if you'd like more information about those case studies and how you use the, the model. Question three then, comparisons of statistical and dynamical downscaling show that they are complementary, not competing tools. They always improve the accuracy of local scenarios. Statistical downscaling always performs better than dynamical downscaling, all of the above. Competing, but not complementary, but not competing. Ah. Oh, everyone's no, no one wants to, no one wants to be different, do they? <laughs> All right. Yes, you're absolutely right. They are complementary, not competing tools. And it goes back to the opening remark that um, you know. 
as we say in England, horses for courses. You pick the tool for the appropriate questions that you're asking. Um, and sometimes a regional climate model is the right tool. Sometimes the statistical downscaling model is the right, uh, uh, right tool. Um, but they don't always improve accuracy because there's lots of uncertainties that are being fed into the model. And as I showed from the Spanish example, sometimes the statistical model does better at simulating some aspects of extreme rainfall than WARF and then other, um, vice versa. So you, there's not much that we can generalize about the two, the two techniques in terms of how they compare, but we can say that we, we should view them as complementary rather than competing. All right. Statistical downscaling is problematic when there are non-stationary predict to predict and conditions, generating scenarios for small islands that are missing observed data or estimating sub-daily quantities. Estimating sub-daily quantities, such as rainfall intensities. Oh, it's follow the leader, is it? Follow B. <laughs> Anyone want something different to be? Oh, C. Okay. Mm. <laughs> okay now this is this is um to be to, to, this is a trick question yeah uh, <laughs> to speak to be fair non-stationary conditions can be problematic for both statistical and down, dynamical downscaling so remember this morning i gave you the example of snow cover or growth for them in an urban area how that changes some very you know gross conditions on the ground or if a weather station is moved, that would be a, a, an aspect of non-stationarity. <laughs> yeah. Now you you can you, you can overcome non-stationarity if there's non-stationarity in the predictors as well that are driving the non-stationary conditions locally. So to a certain extent, this can be overcome, um, as we saw with the extreme temperature uh, workshop, by choosing good predictor variables that capture the change signal. That can be addressed, but it is it is the it is a concern for many aspects of of downscaling. Now, downscaling is probably statistical downscaling is probably your only option for small islands because if you think about them they're often so small that they would be represented as ocean in the grid box you wouldn't you wouldn't even be able to detect that that the small island is a land area so statistical downscaling is good for small islands as i showed you this morning um yeah missing data can be can be an issue if you've got you know, less than 10 years to work with. But down the statistical downscaling, remember, can also infill and repair bridge missing data. And we, we, we looked at that with the temperature example at the last workshop. And then lastly, um, it, it is difficult to uh, downscale sub daily rainfall intensities, but there's a, a, a growing amount of literature that shows how this can be done and as I said the next version of SDSM does include the this this new research to simulate sub daily quantities so there we go non stationarity is a is something we really have to pay attention to finally then uh, actually this was 
this was my drive to work one day uh, coming to campus. Uh, and this this happens on uh, this corner of Loughborough about once or twice a year. So it's a very flood prone, flat, flat, uh, prone to flash flooding. Um, when downscaling extreme precipitation, it is smart to check extreme values using site metadata. Mm -hmm. so Compare values with neighboring sites, apply day of week, number bias and homogeneity tests or all of the above. Oh. Okay, has everyone had a, a, a vote? <laughs> All of the above. There we go. So I think hopefully to, through today's examples, we've seen the, the, the power of, of some knowledge of what's happening at your individual site. And you can go so far with neighboring sites, but if they're a long way away, um, there's, you know, there's that that introduces additional uncertainty. And I've shown you how day of week number bias and homogeneity testing can also be used to check for, for long term shifts in the extreme rainfall. OK. Anyone get five out of five? <laughs> Anyone get four out of five? Yes. Yeah, good. All right. So <laughs> it, it was worth coming today then, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> All right. One, one last slide then, just to sum up before we close. So um, I'd really encourage you to go and look at the, that, that other slide deck to show how this new generation of downscaling tool can be used in smarter ways as part of um, adaptation planning. Um, I really want to emphasize that these tools are not about predicting and acting. They're about evaluating how different decisions um, and structures, systems, natural ecosystems, how they behave under a range of plausible conditions. So again, look at the look at the two or three case studies to see how that's done in in um, in practice. And to 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 finally really stress that the tool that I've been guiding you through here is very versatile. Some of you might want to use the tool to um, check and extend and infill and repair damaged data sets. Um, uh, some of you might just want to simulate really long time series, say from 1948, when you've only got a few fragments of data. Some of you might want to use the tool for risk analysis and adaptation options appraisal. So it's deliberately designed to be versatile to allow you to do all of those tasks. And a lot of effort has been put into the software to have all those supporting diagnostics for extreme frequency analysis, um, graphing, time series plotting, and, and so forth. So we're trying to meet the needs of a very wide and diverse set of, of user, user communities around the world. Um, and there's just a few minutes remaining. Um, any questions that have arisen from today? Anything that's unclear or I can help you with? For now, all clear. <laughs> All clear. Well, <laughs> let, let, let me just end by, you know, thanking you for your um, your patience with me and with, you know, us um, working through the software together remotely. I think I, I think it actually worked reasonably well with yeah. um, <laughs> us doing it in, in different parts of the world. Um, I, I certainly had fun doing that, and I hope you, you know, you learned something a little bit more about statistical downscaling. And even if you go away from today and you think um, that's all fair and well, but I, I don't think I need to use that tool, then hopefully it's been a useful, um, useful investment of your time. But others of you hopefully may have seen, you know, had a taste of what the tool can do. And might want to um, explore in your own time some of the some of the potential applications of this software. So, 
with that thanks very much everyone it was uh it was good to be um part of this uh workshop uh, well thank you rob for 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 being so patient with us and uh, our questions and uh, uh asking for some a little more minutes to finish the times to finish the the, the the exercise so thank you very much for today uh, I, I really enjoyed uh, today and I really I was re really looking forward to this workshop because we always have a nice time when we have a workshop. I hope that the people here and um, uh, who are actually following us remotely also had the fun and the find, find this really interesting. So thank you again for, for everything. I hope that you will be able to um, uh, join us uh, on the other days of the workshop, uh, if not, we will uh, organize lectures and also invite our colleagues to join us and th those also will be nice experiences okay. thank you for today okay thank you bye, bye everyone good to see bye you bye. okay bye. bye then thank you bye, bye. Mm -hmm.